I'd like to call to order the December 6, 2017 Committee of the Whole Council meeting. Uh, I would ask that you rise for an invocation by Mayor Thomas, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Gracious and Eternal Father, we thank you for once again convening to conduct the business for this borough in decency and in order. We also thank you for your divine providence and also your predetermined counsel, which will never be usurped. We just thank you that you would give the heart and minds to each at this bench and to each in our community that which is purpose for the common good. Amen. like to start this meeting with uh, the Fireman of the Year Award. Chief? I was going to let you sit down and make you get no, up again. But... <laughs> so, um, we were tasked with uh, uh, nominating a Firefighter of the Year Award. Uh, the uh, leadership of the fire department uh, selected a name and the officers uh, voted. The firefighter of the year that we did select is uh, Michael Sudlock. Uh, Mike, if you're here, come on up. Uh, a little bit about Mike. Mike has been a member of the Pottstown Fire Department since 1969, where he started as a young volunteer. During his tenure as a volunteer, he's held numerous leadership roles, including deputy chief at the, what, at the, which company was that? North End. North End. Sorry. <laughs> He started here before I was born, so. So in 1988, Michael was hired as a career firefighter at the North End Fire Company, and over the past 48 years, he has responded to tens of thousands of incidents in the borough serving the citizens here. As a career firefighter, Michael continues to demonstrate that he is still a leader by continuously passing his acquired knowledge onto the uh, new firefighters as well as seasoned firefighters. Uh, for his continued informal leadership, uh, Michael has been selected by the fire officers of the Pottstown Fire Department as the Firefighter of the Year. Mike. Uh, number five, Edward E. Hoffman, employee retiree recognition. Also known as Papa Smurf. <laughs> I'm the old man. <coughs> I have here a resolution. Recognizing Edward E. Hoffman for 12 years of dedicated service to the Borough of Pottstown. Whereas Edward E. Hoffman has served the Borough of Pottstown as a dedicated employee since 2005, and whereas during his career with the Borough, he served the community twice by working within the police department as a sworn uniformed police officer and as a civilian processor. And whereas Ed's presence in the police department and in Borough Hall will be truly missed by the people that have worked with him. Now, therefore, be it, and it is hereby resolved by the mayor and town council that Edward E. Hoffman is officially recognized for the outstanding service he has provided to the Borough of Pottstown through 12 years of employment, and further that he has extended best wishes for a happy and well-deserved retirement. Adopted at Pottstown Borough Hall, 100 East High Street, the sixth day of December 2017. Congratulations. Sorry.
Okay, number six on our agenda. The Citizens Leadership Academy graduation ceremony. Courtney, hi, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening, our fourth class of the Citizens Leadership Academy graduates after a 10-week course in borough government. Um, so when I say your name, please come forward. Tamara Charles. Amy Durante. Cynthia Durante. Chris Golden. Nathan Hall. Michael Paulus. Michelle Stasek. Kate Takach. Now, we did have four um, that attended class and were not able to attend the ceremony tonight. They would be Rob Greps, Deborah Lee, Velva Zarley, and Lisa Vanny. I could have a round of applause for everyone. to subcommittee reports. Uh, tell us about the infrastructure, Councilor Cole. Okay. Um, we had our meeting on the 16th of November. Um, with our public works kicked off, uh, installed no parking signs on the on West High Street across from Rock Car Wash. That was always kind of an eyesore. Um, there was all kinds of abandoned cars, parking trailers, parking and things like that. So that's been eliminated. Um, the TV camera, the sewers west of Route 100 to look for any kind of abnormalities and they did some work on some of the sewers along there. Um, as for paving, the contractors, I had some questions about this, the contractors reneged. Um, Doug tried several times to contact them and to no avail, they never kind of showed up so our paving is probably going to be up until next year because of the weather. Um, the Parks and Rec, the pedestrian bridge at Riverfront Park is, uh, has, is finished now. There was originally some structural issues that's been taken care of. Uh, the pavilion is finished in Riverfront Park. Nature play area is progressing well uh, in the Memorial Park. And it's, uh, it's supposed to be planned on being done by the end of November. Is it done now? Can you hear me? 50%, 50%. It's 50% complete? Okay. Um, uh, we had a $100,000 grant for Memorial uh, Park's Institutional Playground from DCED and CFA. And uh, there was $1,890 donated to the Veterans Island and Memorial Park when they had the uh, fundraiser there. So, and that's the end of my report. Very good. I have a question regarding the contractors that uh, reneged on the deal. So next time, will they still be eligible for the contract? And what was the reason for them not following? Um, Doug said that he's going to go after the bond, I guess, right? And I don't know. I, as far as anything else, I, I don't know. You haven't heard anything from him? And the institutional playground, does that have anything for handicapped? Yes, I think I do believe that's for handicapped children. That is correct. The intention of the project is to create a 
playground that is accessible and inclusive. Very good. Thank you. Mayor, I think you had a good point about the um, uh, re, re award, you know, if we were to have this uh, contractor bid again, um, Chuck, how would that impact uh, us legally? Could, could we deny them? All of our bid documents make a request. Have you ever defaulted on a contract? Uh, typically, we wouldn't allow anyone to be a qualified bidder if they defaulted. In this case, they would have defaulted and therefore be ineligible to be awarded a future bid. And with that being said, I, I know that there's no one up here that approves of some of the road conditions that do exist. Although that charge would be laid at our feet, you can see a situation like this means everybody predicted. Okay. Economic development and in our business liaison assistant manager, Keller. Good evening, counselors. Um, yeah, as you've heard, we've uh, been successful in some of our grant applications lately from, uh, as Councilor Culp has mentioned, we did receive $200,000 from DCED for a playground enhancements at Memorial Park that will include ADA accessible um, parking and pathway and playground equipment. Um, shortly after that, we also received word from DCNR that we received another 70000 for that playground so that it will really help us to make that area around the spray park um, really a very entertaining and attractive space for families and children to, to gather and, and spend the day. Um, so uh, we're up to a total of about, with the, including the Disney grant, of about 335000 that we've received for that facility. Um, and then just to correct a previous item, the Swoop River Trail Bridge, uh, which uh, that project is being conducted by the Swoop River Heritage Area uh, for the bridge in Riverfront Park, the construction started this week and they're expected to be completed in about two weeks or so. Oh, okay. um, so the trail in that section will be, will be back open uh, at that time. And um, also I've gotten word that the Safe Routes to School project along Oak Street, which is a, a um, PennDOT funded transportation enhancements project that's been ongoing for some time, uh, is expected to go out to bid in January or February of 2018. Um, that project primarily consists of uh, pavement markings and signage uh, between the school facilities in, in, that, in that area. And um, uh, lastly, I just wanted to announce that the Bike League of, uh, of America has recognized the borough of Pottstown uh, with an honorable mention as a bicycle friendly community. So um, with all of the um, bike improvements that we've been uh, conducting lately, uh, we've been, we're now starting to get the recognition for that. That will hopefully help us to attract uh, residents and businesses to the area. Um, we're not an official designation yet, but we hope to go for a, a bronze certification next year. They noted that one of the items that was missing uh, from our application was a bicycle education for adults. So we'll actually be looking for a grant to do some bicycle education for adults and children as we roll out the Walk Bike project in 2018. And um, an update on Walk Bike, they are constructing sidewalks along High Street. Right now, um, they're, they're pretty much uh, almost complete along High Street, and they're starting to move up to up rolling in Jackson Street. They hope to be completed um, by the end of the year, or if not by then, shortly thereafter. Thank you. Very good. I have one quick question. Sure. The um, closed loop system, the the corners that they're putting in now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the color of the concrete used there does not match the surrounding. And I think we had this discussion a couple meetings ago when we, we were talking about an ordinance for replacing sidewalk has to meet uh, or match the color of the existing sidewalk there or whatever. So on one side. Okay, so you're right on both sides, like if we look at the brick house, there's the corner, it's white, the sidewalk around it is brown. So, I think you did well on time. I remember when I had to get a patch replaced in mine, it was a much lighter gray than the rest, but uh, it, the UV will hit it and then it'll be more uniform as it weathers. I know it's the two, but uh, <coughs> yeah, also the, um, the, the ADA curb ramps are not subject to the sidewalk. Ordinance, there. That's a PennDOT requirement. Mm. Um, so, but I, I, I would agree with Councilor Proxel that 
you know, that is a, a plain white cement that they've applied there that will weather and age over time and match the adjacent sidewalks. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing more, uh, we'd also like to hear from Peggy Lee Clark about economic development. Welcome. Good evening, Councilors and Mayor. I just wanted to update you on the economic development. Um, the community, the business leaders community, as you are aware, have started an economic development awareness campaign, and I wanted to report to you tonight that um, just in a month's time, there were 15,487 views of the IPIC Pottstown videos. We will continue to highlight lots of different businesses and business leaders within the community. Um, our reach has been close to 30,000 people um, through that campaign. And one concrete example, I was contacted by an individual who wants to move his business to Pottstown. We met and within three weeks a lease was, sent, uh, was signed. He will be moving his business in January 2018 to the Pottstown Industrial Complex. Okay. Thank you. Thank Peggy, you. since the lease was signed, can you tell us what that business is? I don't think that they have uh, agreed to have it signed or uh, public yet. Okay, transportation. Councilor Cole. There you go. I can't hear you. <laughs> anyway, um, our last transportation meeting had been canceled, and we just had one tonight, so we really don't have any. Um, notes from that tra that meeting, but we'll have me notes for the maybe next week or Very January. Good. Okay. Uh, OBGC Ricketts. Uh, Any there is a report in your packet. Anything to add? Nothing to add. Okay. You know, I, I just went and I, I have one thing. What, what, we all know the news about the YMCA closing, and, and I think um, I've gotten a lot of feedback about you know, what What are we going to do with the, the kids now, so on and so forth, and all of that, I think this is an opportunity for them to continue to increase um, membership because that, that's a resource in our community that I think is highly underutilized. Good. I'd like to also mention that over the summer there was a uh, very active basketball league that went on. And uh, there were some light replacements that had to go on, not at the magnitude of the high school, but those lights were actually replaced by my son and daughter-in-law with the help of uh, Borough Manager Flanders on the day of a very important start to, to, a, to the programming that was going on. So I just wanted to add that as well. Good. Watch Town School Board, Mr. Heidel. Anyone from the school board? Okay. Library, Mr. Green. No. Nope. Ad hoc zoning, Councilor Prosper, in the meeting. Animal Committee, Vice President Miller. Um, I just want to let everybody know that Pottstown Falls is going to be doing Santa photos with pets downtown this Saturday at the New York Plaza um, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So I hope to see Dakota and Maggie there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maggie will be there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Safety, Chief Drumhill. Good evening, Council. I just want to let you know that the camera the two cameras that we we uh, purchased there with a the grant are in the process of being put in. I would suspect that they should be completed within the next couple of weeks. At this point, it's just uh, getting the electric and everything hooked up. So uh, they're working on that. We're hoping they, they can get that done in two weeks. And they are both in areas that would be very beneficial for the borough and the police. Uh, one of the things that I also want to say is we were very successful for the No Shave November. 
And based on that, we are going to do Christmas shopping or holiday shopping on December the 16th, and we'll be inviting 35 children to okay. purchase gifts. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Chief, yes. I'm sorry, I, have a, I actually have a, a safety question. The, with the closed loop system, the new lights that are going in, uh, my understanding that the light, at, there's been a lot of accidents at King and Manitoni. The light is so large that people are looking down King Street Correct. at the light at High Street. Is there, is there any correction that can be done to that? We actually just had a meeting with Doug in reference to that because the lights sit back and Doug has assured me, am I correct, Doug, that, that intersection will be getting additional lights too. That will eventually get the full upgrade. Unfortunately, right now, we're waiting to find out when the bridge is going on because we don't want to have the bases for the new poles put in on the bridge side for fear they're going to be in the way. So we will make some upgrades to the thing in the interim, but that intersection will get a full upgrade. It's just a matter of the coordination with the bridge. And, and the interim will be when? Right now, the contractor is working out Charlotte Street, and he'll go out Charlotte to um, the Mervine when he's finished out there, and then we'll <coughs> direct them down that way. We have a light up in Burke. <coughs> I'm Burke's has to be picked up. King of Manitoba, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, I'm hoping to, to reuse some of the better components that we have at other intersections, at least upgrade that as much as I can with existing equipment that we have. And while we're still on safety, <coughs> and, and and Doug, this applies to you. There's there's a lot of lights out in the 100 block of High Street. Street lights that I'm under the understanding that it's a Pico issue. And Pico was contacted and they haven't been repaired as of yet. So um, we can't just leave it at, we're gonna contact Pico. If Pico is not going to take care of the power that they need to take care of, we need to contact the PUC. We can't just let it go at oh, well, it's a PICO problem and we're not going to do anything about it because it's dark, it's dangerous, and there's businesses down there that are trying to, they're trying to have good high-end businesses down there and they're having a lot of difficulty. So where are we, do you know, with the lights that are out in the street? Well, we're in discussion. I'm, I'm just ready to put another list down to PICO again with the dates that the lights have been out since, and uh, we're trying to get them to get their underground people up here. Uh, all the problems are underground. They have to dig up the, the streets and try and locate where the wires have burned off at. Yeah. I understand the problem. I just want to make sure that we're pursuing the... the yeah, we are. Yeah. Actually, well, Councilor Miller, this morning I received an email from PICO um, with their list of, of, of work orders on the lights that they've worked on. Um, and I think we need to go through that because what has happened is they've come in, they've repaired a light, and then the next one on the string goes out. Um, so. Doug and I will get together this week, and if, if we can't get a resolution from PICO, then I think yeah, what you're suggesting would be appropriate. And just for your information, though, uh, the police department on a regular basis goes out and surveys street lights, and when we find them, we create a list and turn it over to Doug. We did that probably just a month ago. Okay. I have a question as well um, about newly inserted cameras um, at Franklin and High Street. Uh, someone had made a call to me and noted that one of them is not rotating 360 degrees. Are they supposed to rotate? Uh, that camera has to be is part of getting the one that's getting realigned. Basically what happened was when we had that camera installed originally, it was looking at the bank, which is now closed. So we didn't have the camera rotating, so we were always focused on the bank. Now you can see both banks from that corner. Now we're going to release that and have the camera turn back, but that's part of the reconfiguration of the new system. Is there, is there a time frame? I'm hoping everything happens by the end of December. Okay, thank you. And also, uh, in addition to, uh, this is school safety, so maybe it's an intersection of school and police, but uh, some recent activity at one of our school districts is now um, placing me in a position, even transitioning out of being the mayor to be concerned about uh, issues within the school where there's possible criminal activity and uh, this may lead to a push for cameras in every classroom so i don't know if that you know, that's something that maybe will be coming up in the future so, okay thank you good uh, <clears throat> emergency services reports good evening uh, council and mayor 
Uh, my name is Miles Feather. I'm with the Phillies. I'm the vice president. And I'm going to give you our, our monthly report. Um, for training this month, we currently and still have five uh, firefighters that are in the instructor one and educational methodology uh, certification class, and they should be graduating in January. Our seniors, along with our juniors and explorers, uh, did a simulated search and rescue uh, with missing person down at the Memorial Park this past month, and we got everybody back okay. Uh, fundraising, uh, we had our Chinese auction just recently down at, uh, we had, held it down at the Goodwill Fire Company. We thanked them for uh, um, giving us their space to use, and it was our most successful to date. Uh, we still have our sportsman's raffle going off. Anybody needs any of, wants any of those tickets, please contact myself. Um, our officers, we have two other officers here, please contact them. As I reported last month, uh, we have remodeled our basement and begun hanging some old photos along with some of our newer photos, and we're still looking for sponsors for those photos which will be hung in our basement and meeting room. Our juniors and explorers this month, uh, the juniors and explorers worked with uh, SCBA and search and rescue in a confined controlled environment. The activity was monitored and supervised by our senior firefighters. Uh, In-house events, um, on New Year's Day, we will have pork and sauerkraut in our, in our social room for our, for our members and a guest at no cost to them, because sometimes people just don't have a place to go. In the community, we will be participating with the Pottstown uh, PD's Shop with a Cop on Saturday, December 16th at 10, uh, 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we will be chauffeuring Santa Claus around town on Sunday, December 16th on top of engine 694 starting at noon. So watch and listen for Santa coming to your neighborhood. That's all I have. Good evening, counselors. Um, <clears throat> As, uh, as Miles just gave the report, the report that we give every month is just to let everyone know in the community how hard we're trying to work to keep things uh, alive in the community, as um, how hard the fire company works, all the fire companies work together to, uh, to make known what it takes to run a, a fire company or a volunteer organization. Um, over the past couple of years, I personally talked to everybody except for Councilor Arms, about the past, the present, and the future of the fire department, the volunteer fire department in Pottstown. Since we have talked, things haven't got any better. Volunteer firefighters are so hard to find, and if you do find them, keeping them is uh, through them going to 188 hours of school and then come back to Pottstown to risk their life for no pay. It, the line is not very long. Um, everything we do in town, um, as far as... Uh, uh, the things that we do as far as uh, helping, running calls, close, probably close to a thousand calls a year. Um, and all the fundraisers. Um, fundraisers back then were pretty good and the, and the borough really, the citizens really backed you up. That doesn't happen. Fundraisers are so hard to do to make any money. Um, across the country, volunteer firefighters, volunteer fire companies are closing every week. Um, for two main reasons, lack of volunteer or lack of money. In our, in our uh, situation in Pottstown, we have both those situations. It's very hard to operate the fire company and to take care of the firefighters. I think that um, the council even voted on to give the fire, volunteer firefighters who lived in Pottstown a stipend or a tax break. And that was happening like June and we have, no, we have heard nothing since. Uh, if to help that, to give them a little boost to make them more interested in staying uh, a volunteer firefighter. Um, as everything else, the firefighters that we have now are getting older, or getting married, changing jobs, moving out. It's very hard to maintain the number of firefighters that we can to safely control a fire situation. Um, we need all the help working together between the borough and uh, the fire, all the fire companies together to continue to do that. Um, with different incentive programs, anything the incentive programs or anything that we can do to help um, keep interested. Um, plus some of the other things, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but if somebody's gonna give me a $5.2 million 
uh, gift each, each year, I'd make sure I secure it for the next year. So if the, if the counselors can come into the fire companies, see where we're at, talk to us, see what we need to do to continue to move forward, probably get some, some uh, incentive breaks for the firefighters and, and try to work together to make that happen. Kevin Yerger from Goodwill Fire Company. I apologize that I wasn't here at the November meeting as I was on vacation, but I would like to go back and update you on what was going on at Goodwill in October. Um, besides the emergency calls, 52 of those, by the way, um, we had several things going on throughout the month. October 7th, we attended a live burn with the West End Fire Company. Um, October 16th and 17th, four officers uh, went to officer development classes at the Abington Public Safety Training Center. Um, October 16th, we did an extrication training at Goodwill in the back parking lot. That's when we cut up the big van that was sitting out back. Uh, October 19th, we took part in the PART, the Pottstown Area Rapid Transit Bus Awareness Training. Uh, October 21 and 22, we did Fire Academy lunches at the Montgomery County uh, Public Safety Training Center. That's a, a large fundraiser for us. Um, throughout that month, we also had four people attend a bus rescue operations class. That's a 16-hour class on extricating people from bus accidents, just working with a bus. Uh, that was held down at Sanatoga Fire Company. We had a member attend instant incident safety officer class at the fire academy. October 30th, we had two people attend a Stop the Bleed Train the Trainer in uh, Harrisburg so that we actually have a couple instructors that can go out and teach uh, how to control bleeding, whether it be anything from minor to massive damage uh, up to and including tourniquets. Uh, as far as fire prevention, it was a, a pretty busy month for us. We attended displays at the Home Depot, New Hanover Fire Company, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the Lower Potts Grove Community Day. We did prevention lectures to classrooms in schools at the Early Head Start, the Grace Early Learning Center for multiple days, peak at the Pottstown High School, the YMCA, the Head Start, the Wincroft Highland House, the YWCA, Hens, Dotland Academy, and Barth Elementary. That one was done in conjunction with the Phillies effort. <clears throat> we did uh, fire extinguisher training at the Masonic Lodge for the people who were running the Temple of Terror. They had a lot of things going on inside that building and they asked us to come out and go over fire extinguishers, safety, exit drills, and what to uh, do if their fire alarm system would activate uh, during their display. Uh, we also attended the Halloween parade and safe houses at the Y and at Manor Care. In November, we did uh, another 55 emergency calls. We attended the Hill Schools bonfire, stood by for that, and we were involved with uh, two uh, episodes with the Red Cross smoke detector program where we went out and hung door hangers and then on Saturday morning went back out and actually either installed smoke detectors or inspected the ones that they have or helped them out with batteries or any number of things that had to do with their smoke detectors. And the target area was up in the manor in the West Walnut Street, West Chestnut, West Beach. Um, in addition to that, on the 4th, we had seven members attend the Art of First Do. That's a renowned speaker that came into the area. We were at East Greenville Fire Company for eight hours uh, learning about what to do when you're the first one on the scene of a fire. On the 6th, uh, we did a safety talk for a Girl Scout troop in our station. The 14th was um, our training night. We were doing driver training and pump training on Squad 69. On the 16th, uh, we installed 15 more smoke detectors in various houses throughout the borough. The 18th, we did another Fire Academy lunch, another fundraiser. Um, 25th, we did some training on the river, which I'll get to in a minute. And the 29th, we installed two more smoke detectors. And all throughout the month, uh, similarly to the Phillies, we have two people attending the Instructor One program. Uh, upcoming through uh, December, we have another extrication training. That's actually tomorrow night. We're training with Ring Hill up uh, in Lower Potts Grove, cutting the car apart. On the 14th, we're doing an EMS training that will uh, 
help us out with the use of a new drug that we're going to have on the ambulance. Um, primary any, primarily an EMS effort, uh, but it will help the firemen as well. It's a, it's a training on the uses of ketamine. Uh, 1217, we'll be helping out the Phillies and going out and doing the Santa run. And there'll be an EMT class. We're holding that at Goodwill Fire Company. It's in conjunction with Montgomery County. We don't have anything to do with the actual administration of the class. We use all of our equipment and all of our own instructors to teach the class in-house. Um, so as long as there is enough enrollment, that'll start on January the 6th. Um, one of the trainings that we did on the river, just to let you know, um, a new initiative for Goodwill Fire Company is that we partnered with Lansdale uh, EMS and we purchased two used inflatable rescue boats for use in, in our community. Um, along with that came a lot of water rescue equipment, some life vests, some PFDs, some ring buoys, all the equipment that would go along with the boat, oh, and the trailers. Um, so we've been going out as long as the weather's been nice, and yeah, we're fair weather trainers at this point, um, going out and getting used to using the boats. We want to get proficient in it. We are not responding to calls at this point until we become proficient. Um, a lot of our people are already trained at the boat operations and all the other levels of water rescue. However, we want to get we want to get good at operating those boats before we start to try and rescue somebody. In the meantime, we will continue to rely on Collegeville and Linfield to help us with those water rescues should we need uh, to do anything by boat. We will be opening up uh, approximately six new classes that will be open to all of the firefighters in Pottstown to try to get us a solid water rescue response team that should we need to put those boats into service, we have a, a good group of people that are going to be able to go out and affect that. Um, finally, uh, before the meeting, I was uh, speaking to Council President Wien and he uh, referred to the big number at the end of the year. And, uh, and unfortunately, I knew what he meant by that. And I just want to take a second to explain our big number. Um, you guys give us $196,000 a year, broken down over 12 months. And where does it go? Um, $162,500 just goes to staff. That's wages and workman's comp and about $300 in uniform costs for, the, for 2016. Um, my drivers make eleven fifty an hour. That's it. Part-time work, $10 an hour. <clears throat> $196,000, take away that $162,000 that's all for staff, that leaves me with $33,000 to pay for vehicle expenses, maintenance, fuel, insurance on the rest of the stuff, liability on the equipment, auto insurance, um, just those couple things come to $29,000 every year. 2016, we took $14,000 of Goodwill's fundraising money to supplement the borough account because it, it just wasn't there. Um, so I understand that the borough is tight. Please understand that we are just as tight. And I again repeat, my staff is making $11.50 an hour, and they've been at that rate or a similar rate as long as I've been chief, and this is my seventh year. I'm sorry, eighth year. Um, Charlie talked about the fundraising, and you've heard the fundraising efforts that we do. Hopefully you've seen some of the fundraising that we've done throughout the year that you may not have heard about in my reports because they're not uh, timely here. But um, I would like to ask one quick question or two quick questions before we go. Uh, if anybody can help me out, because I'd really like to help these people out, you know, when is the police department going to be doing a hoagie sale for their next new vehicle? Or when will Public Works be out doing a boot drive to help fix the roof on their building? Because that's what we're doing. That's what our fundraising money goes to. I'm making a, a bunch of lunches 
for the fire academy so that I can fix my roof, pay for my rescue truck, $956 per month over almost 15 years now. Um, that's what we're doing. Thank you. Good evening, counselors. Uh, Dave Vondick, Chief of North End Fire Company, for those of you who don't know who I am. Um, I'm, I, don't, I don't want to go into too much detail, especially because I don't want to reiterate a lot of things, but the trainings, um, the bus rescue class, we had multiple firefighters involved in that. We have multiple firefighters involved in the uh, Instructor One course that's ongoing right now. Um, but the big, biggest thing I wanted to use my time up here for is, uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm in the, I was in the process this afternoon of doing interviews um, because uh, career firefighter Michael Sedlock has announced his retirement uh, from North Ham Fire Company. But what I want to do is use this time to basically thank him for his years of dedicated service to North Ham Fire Company and his selfless acts of kindness towards the fire company and towards the citizens of the borough of Pottstown. Um, unfortunately, our interviews ran a little late. I wasn't here, able to be here for the presentation, but it was definitely well-deserved. And I thank each and every one of you for the consideration for him for that award. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely, again, I can't stress enough, it's very well-deserved. Um, you know, as Kevin expressed, uh, each one of the four fire companies is financially strapped. Um, you know, North End Fire Company, we had to make a lot of bold and drastic moves over the last six to eight months to be able to provide fire protection service to the borough of Pottstown. You know, we have an obligation as the North End Fire Company and the Pottstown Fire Department to provide financial, or for not financial, uh, fire protection service to the borough of Pottstown. But also the borough has a responsibility to provide us with the resources to provide that service. Um, you know, again, you know, we were standing out on a street corner Black Friday when a lot of our members could have been home with their families. I had 11 members standing on the corner of Charlotte and Wilson Street with a fire boot in their hand asking for donations. Um, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough across the board, but, you know, we definitely need to, to work together and work to a common goal and get to a common solution to this problem versus, you know, coming at the fire companies constantly to, you know, what, what can we cut from you? What can we do for you? You know, what can we take away from you? We need to get away from that mentality. We need to get to the mentality of what can we do to better the department and better the protection of the borough of Pottstown. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council members, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm, not, I'm not up here. I wanna, I'm not going to talk to you about the financials, but I want to talk to you about how good your fire department is. These guys are volunteers. They come and told you that they do a lot of activities. Um, the... Uh, unfortunate news that I have for you is actually last night uh, we did experience a dwelling fire. Uh, we burned a third floor apartment, a bedroom in an apartment. Um, I will tell you that the first firefighter through the door was one of the career firefighters. He was able to keep the fire in check until the rest of the volunteers arrived. So we are very dependent upon the volunteers. Um, as a result of this fire, six people are displaced. So uh, it could have been a lot worse, but because we're able to get on scene and these volunteers do a fantastic job. Um, w when I arrived, I got an overview of the situation. I turn around, I had 30 volunteers standing in front of me. Okay, but you gotta also remember, since I've been here, this is the first dwelling fire. And these guys are very anxious to show you how good they are. So when it came in as a dwelling fire, they were there to show up and, and do their part. <coughs> I wish I had 30 firefighters every call that I go on to. I can go to a fire alarm in our high rise, which is a reported fire, and I got four or five guys. So I wanted to let you know that you have a fantastic fire department. The volunteers here, um, are, on average, are saving you between four and five million dollars a year if this was a, a totally career fire department. Um, they talk to you a little bit about training. We've uh, looking at the last couple ISO reports, which is the insurance service office, which basically determines the insurance that the businesses have to play, uh, have to pay rather, is the borough has, is a four. Uh, we should be a three. Where we got beat up is on our documentation and or amount of training. So as you, as you heard, they're, they're doing their part. They're stepping up. They're doing the training. We're bringing training to town, which is new for them. Before they had to travel outside of town, um, 
in cooperation with the officers, we're bringing this training here so that we can increase our ISO rating to a three, which would mean better rates for our businesses as our, and our homeowners. Uh, administratively, I am uh, reviewing our policies, are updating our policies uh, so that they are more current and more in line and more efficient. Uh, in addition, moving into next year, uh, working with the solicitor, uh, we are pushing to maybe strengthen some of our ordinances as well as the fire code uh, to make it more safe and more efficient. Uh, we're, we are sending information to the Pennsylvania Department of Labor Industry, which requires their approval before we can do it locally here. Once we get their approval, I will be in front of you again making the recommendations for those. But I, again, I just wanted to stress that you have an excellent fire department here, and they make my job easy. Without them, I, I'm just one guy. So thank you. Thank you. Chief Lassar, yes, I just want to, um, I spent hundreds of hours with the fire departments in the last couple of years learning about the fire services, and I think I have a pretty good handle on what you provide to the borough and the expenses and the shortfalls that you're experiencing. My November borough buzz even went out to the fire companies and tried to, you know, we <coughs> interviewed each one of the fire companies to express the difficulties, the challenges, and everything that the, that the fire companies are facing today. I want to thank each and every fire department for their service. I want to offer my apologies for a memo that you received. Um, I think it is completely out of line. I'm very upset that it had happened. There is no reason for anybody to be threatening fire companies for a reduction in monthly funds when they are providing their financial reports as required by their service agreements. And um, again, there was only one person on council that had knowledge of this mem memo and six counselors were unaware. So again, you have my sincerest apologies, and thank you for your service, and we'll be discussing more of this during budget. Thank you. Very good. Mayor's report. Oh, sure, thank you. I'd just like to thank the fire service. That was uh, a very comprehensive uh, report that you provided. And uh, to uh, Mr. Pierce at the Phillies Fire Company, as you talk about volunteerism, uh, and you have the most volunteers, I think. Is that true? Is he still here? Charlie? Uh, I don't know that. Uh, if, if I may. Please. Ms. Mayor, uh, on, on record, the Phillies do have the most amount of volunteers on record. And again, I, I, they are very um, integral. Uh, but again, as you saw, as I gave the report earlier, when we have the big fire, that's when they come out. Um, I do need the volunteers on, on the small calls. Um, and between the four companies, the continued support and commitment from them is about the same. However, the Phillies, again, to answer your question, do have the most on paper. Thank you. I also was uh, at an event for first responders where they had a lot of their volunteers there, and there were quite a few young people. So that was a, the point that I was driving at, that they had recruited some young people to be involved in their volunteerism, which is excellent for a community um, such as Pottstown per se, with a school district with, you know, the free and reduced lunch criteria. And volunteerism really attaches itself in Maslow's hierarchy of needs right at the top. So anywhere you have volunteers, people really understand. And they're not struggling at the bottom of that pyramid with a sense of belonging. They've gone past that. So any time that you do see volunteerism, you know that you have strong people. And to answer that with the, the young firefighters that we are recruiting, we do have an agreement with the school district and, and a cooperation agreement with the school district to, to attempt to recruit the, the junior firefighters. Um, the Phillies have an explorer program as well as Empire and the North End has a junior program, and the difference between an explorer is an explorer is 14 and 15 years old, where a junior firefighter is 16 and 17. So, and and what is the limit for a firefighter? I mean, I heard the comment that many are getting older. What does getting older mean in terms of signing up to be a firefighter? Well, to actually fight fire inside a building, you have to be a minimum of 18 years old, and, and that it deals with the child labor laws. Plus, we also try to do it safely. 
you got to remember, though, everybody's running out of a burning building. We're the ones running in. Um, so it kind of does make us a little crazy, I think. But um, it's a very dangerous and a very physical job. The equipment that we wear alone can wear anywhere from 50 to 60 pounds. So as we start to age, our body's taking a toll. Um, I, I can tell you that in my 32 years of fighting fire, I've broken my back, I've broken my knees, I've broken my ankles probably about seven times. So it's a very physical, demanding job that does take its wear and tear on the body. And as they do start to age, they're finding that they want to come out less and less because it, it is painful. So, but we, we are always looking for the, the new and the younger firefighters, and we will train them and outfit them. Okay. So what is the maximum age? And is there any criteria such as with police, they have to go through physical agility as part of their hiring process? And in a career, um, in a career company situation, is that a requirement versus the volunteer? Being that it's volunteer, um, the, to, put, to be blunt, are, are you 18, do you have a pulse, and can you walk upright? I, I mean, quite honestly, we're taking any help that we're getting. The, uh, there's no age limit. Okay. Um, we do have some firefighters that are in their 70s. They may not be running into the buildings on fire, but they do help in other ways. Okay, thank you. That was really, really what I was trying to find, is if there is a limit, and there is not. There is under not. Under the volunteer situation. And, and we're always looking for help. Well, I'll, I'll train you personally. <laughs> there you go. Don't tempt me. Because <laughs> I'll show up. Well, I'd just like to make this, um, like, this is probably the last uh, time as mayor that I'll be in a broadcast for PCTV. So I would just like to thank all of the voters who've come out, not only over these two terms, but the voters that have stood by me through the first school board race in 1997, where I had to pull out of the public forum for uh, an emergency C-section to come back to become a part of a very strong team to uh, you know, sweep the school board race on both sides. That was very exciting. After two years of um, operating under the notion that how unpolitical the school board was with my feet to the fire learned exactly how political the school board was and after two years uh, felt an onus and an unction and a desire to come to the municipal side of government to understand the inner workings from this side that required a transition for me from one side of the political aisle as a Democrat to the side of the Republican was that, a decide, was that a decision on the philosophy of one side or another? It absolutely was not. But irregardless of the parameters that were the driver behind that decision, I can say today that I understand more about the political process from partisanism as well as how it should be better separated from governance. So I'd just like to say, um, I think I could write a book on that just by my personal experiences in Pottstown. It was very <coughs> overwhelming to be elected by people that I knew were long-term Democrats who were very afraid but confident because they knew me from the grassroots and they knew me from community advocacy, not so much as um, organizing people but resourcing people so that they could be empowered <coughs> to pursue their own decisions with knowledge and to make their own choices from a menu of options and not just by, per se, having a big giant group for one person's problem. So the more people that are actually empowered and understand how to pursue their issues really raises the base. And we're only as strong as our weakest link. And I believe also one thing that I've always stressed is that the common stock and the wealth of a community is the people. And um, I'll, I never have lost sight of that and I never will lose sight of that. I would like to thank the colleagues and the presidents and managers that I've worked with over the years. Um, I wouldn't say it was stressful, 
Of course, they can't say it's stressful either because they're getting a lot more money than I am to do their job. So <laughs> I think they're, they're quite suited and um, equipped for the challenges that they face. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just bring up three points um, that cover both terms. And one of those, I don't have it written down here. One of those is uh, the Mayor's Initiative on Neighborhoods, which was inside of the first term, which was expanded into the CARES Day and expanded into the CARES Day with uh, the Hill School, the Community College, and the school district all coming together for a select and intentional day of service to the community. And back to the original thrust of the Mayor's Initiative on Neighborhoods was to encourage residents to come out and be a part of that same intentionality on their own. Um, and that still is in position and that still is needed because it's really about the empowerment of every person who's living in Pottstown, you know, uh, from house to house, from corner to corner, whether it's a business or a home or an apartment, everybody has a part to play. Um, I'd like to talk about the prayer initiative uh, that was instituted during the first term of having an invocation. And during this term, we alternated with invocation and moment of silence. But I was just reviewing yesterday the Senate. The United States Senate opens in prayer with every session. Those prayers are not restricted. Our prayers had been restricted. There were people that prayed in Jesus' name in the state Senate in Washington, D.C. And, you know, this uh, prayer effort did not only just include people that would be present in this room, but others that uh, commit to keep the issues of the borough lifted in prayer, which is a universal spiritual activity that no one owns. And I think that um, we should always be thankful for those who take a position in prayer for the betterment of the common good. And I think I mentioned that in my prayer invocation today. The second thing I'd like to highlight is the number of weddings. Over two terms, close to 100 weddings. And that's important. And another thing I'd just like to mention in the context of weddings is the stabilization of a nation. The stabilization of a nation boils down to the stabilization of families. So the more stable families we have, the more stable our nation is. So the stabilization of families, and just to mention that was one of the most fun parts of the job was conducting those wedding ceremonies. But as I uh, continue, the stabilization of families will be a priority as I would continue in the grassroots and also learning more about the urban areas in the 6th Congressional District. And that's very important because many of those um, families in that district are in challenging school districts that are underfunded. And that is an issue at hand all across America, but especially in areas where we know that there are distinct deficits that are leading to um, substandard existences in some areas, such as Reading, Pennsylvania, with a, possibly by now over $100 million deficit. Teachers are purchasing school supplies to conduct their education, the educational process, and these um, expenses are not tax deductible. So I want to go and move on to an intersecting government issue in this transition for myself. As far as um, leaving the office of mayor as one government representation, I will still continue in the government representation through spiritual angles. And I invite you on December 31st to attend a special service where I've been given a, 
a bench that's going to have a lot of influence in the community in the coming years. Having met a carpenter who has uh, produced a bench for me that says live, love, and laugh. Well, what does that have to do with government? It has to do with the government of understanding that where there's some place for you to kneel, where there's some place for you to sit, where there's a safe place for you to lay down your head, there is a place for you to remember others that do not have, do not have this privilege. There are others that do not share in many of the privileges that we take for granted in America. So if you'd like more information on that location for December 31st, uh, please contact me. And um, I would be glad to see you. It'll be 10 a.m. on that day. That's the end of my report. And thank you all so very much. Thank you. Um, our manager's report, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Wien. Um, first, I want to correct a uh, misperception or misstatement by Councilor Miller. She is correct that a memorandum was sent to the four company chiefs, fire chiefs. Um, it was not a threatening memo. In fact, it was a memorandum advising them um, that I was going to introduce a concept at the borough council meeting today to borough council. Um, in fact, it specifically said that I wanted to give them a heads up so that they weren't blindsided. Um, it's disappointing that somebody would perceive trying to be inclusive and transparent is inappropriate. But nonetheless, um, you all received emails from the three of the four fire companies today that I suspect some of you had no idea um, what the emails were referencing. Um, for clarification, last year uh, you would ask the four companies to provide council um, with monthly updates. And over the past year, you've received updates from one company and intermittently, intermittently the other three. Um, to help motivate the companies um, to provide those monthly reports, last week I notified them that I would be suggesting the withholding of some monthly funding as an incentive, not taking funding away, but withholding funding and then repaying it as the reports were given. Since that memorandum went out to the four chiefs, um, I met with Kevin Yerger, the chief of Goodwill. He spoke this evening. He shared some of his concerns regarding the concept. Um, and today you all received the emails um, from three of the other company chiefs. Um, some of the concerns that were shared are valid. Um, and with that said, um, I'm not going to be making the recommendation. In fact, uh, it probably would have went unnoticed if we would have had the discussion and left it at that. But nonetheless, um, I'll be passing it on to Justin uh, moving forward and he can address the four companies and hopefully come up with a means to get this done that uh, isn't perceived in the way this was perceived. Um, I want to let everybody know that the next Joint Borough Council School Board meeting will be held on Monday, January the 22nd at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Pottstown High School Cafeteria. Um, I believe the school board has a voting meeting, which I've been told will be very short. Um, at that time, uh, the joint meeting can commence. Also want to remind everyone that tomorrow, December 7th, is Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, if you have an American flag, please fly it at half-mast. Um, and I know that many of you had questions regarding the closing of Pollock Park uh, for environmental reasons. Uh, I believe that all of you received some talking, po talking points uh, that were drawn up by our engineers. Um, I'd ask Mr. Keller uh, to provide an update as to where we are today with that. Sure, thank you. Um, so through the master plan development at Pollock Park, uh, one of the recommendations was to undergo a phase one environmental site assessment because the site was used as a former um, scrapyard for many years. Um, we went through and did the phase one and um, after the phase one was concluded they recommended that we go in and um, have soil samples uh, conducted uh, to, to determine the nature of the, the contaminants that, that may be present um, in, that, in, that, uh, in that soil. Um, we did receive a grant through the uh, EPA uh, Brownfield Assessments Program to conduct the environmental assessments at the park and we did get preliminary uh, results back on November 22nd um, at about 2.30 p.m. Uh, where it was indicated uh, that there are heavy metals and PCBs present in the soil of that site. Um, I have to commend our staff. They acted quickly and appropriately, and they closed the park and posted it with signs um, until we have the results of the study validated. Um, the consultants, environmental standards, who are looking into this for us, uh, since the soil, since the contaminants are contained in the soil, 
and Pollock Park is covered with either paving or grass. They feel that there's uh, little potential for contamination uh, via airborne contaminants to the neighboring properties. Um, but nonetheless, the park will remain cl closed out of an abundance of caution. Um, you know, it should be noted that uh, the PAD um, residential minimum uh, concentration standards are based on a residential, um, very conservative scenario, a residential scenario. So assuming that somebody would be living there you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which isn't the case at a park. You're, you're in for a few hours and, and you're out. But nonetheless, um, we are closing it until we complete our assessment. And more than likely, uh, it will remain closed until we can um, get a grant from either the EPA or DP, DEP uh, or DCNR or a combination of those to clean up the site and um, have it remediated. Thank you, Justin. And finally, I hope you all have a happy and safe holiday season. Is it a way? Can I, can I make one more point? Um, this is regarding uh, Ms. Clark and the new manufacturing business. I did receive a call from that individual as well to meet with, him, with me. And um, I did make him aware that I was the outgoing mayor and uh, he still wanted to meet with me until this morning. And he called and canceled that meeting, and I directed him to call Jenny, the borough manager's secretary, to get Mayor-elect Henrik's information that they could commence with whatever type of issues he's bringing to the table. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, number 10 is a presentation by our utilities department. Again, I'm Brent Wagner, Utilities Director. Uh, the scope of this is last week we met with uh, two council members, Kirkland and Miller, and plus Mark and Justin to discuss our budgets. And a part of that presentation, I was requested tonight to present what is the basically the value of the authority and what is the utilities uh, department uh, offering. Just a brief analysis in regards to our budget. As you're aware, the water and sewer rates did not, were not increasing next year. Uh, the water operating budget of the water treatment plant is 1.5 million, and the sewer, but a sewer, the wastewater treatment budget is 3.7 million. If you had a chance to review that, you'll see the water budget is maintained for the operations end. The sewer, the wastewater treatment plant has increased 9%. And that is directly correlated to the capital improvement plans that we're introducing next year with a new, dr new dryer operation. Um, a quick review of you, you look at the income or from our ratepayers and our townships that provide our income to the utilities department and Doug's department as well. The authority brings in $15.5 million in a year. And after all the expenses, debts are paid, there's an excess of about $3 million left that goes in compartments of paying or associated field like Mark, I'll, I'll pick on Mark, you know, 60 to 65 percent of his salary is paid by the utilities department. Same with Justin and other departments up here, other except police and the fire and numerous other departments. Basically, as you look forward where we're headed next with the, the, the department and authority, the authority will be debt free in 2022-23. So if you look at what the authority is currently doing, about $3 million in capital improvements in the town and with the water and wastewater treatment plant, uh, we're going to increase that up to almost $8 million a year in the near future, which means there's going to be a tremendous amount of construction going on in the streets with new sewer lines and new water lines. And obviously, hopefully, you don't have the same debacle that we had in regards to paving. We'll be paving more borough streets and obviously helping out the townships that we support in regards to the water systems and the sewer systems. In reference to what we have done to offset our increases, have you hear, you know, in 2023, we're debt free, but if you look at the cost savings that we've done just briefly, is like electric. Um, the entire borough authority bid it out the electric 
and over the next through, two, two, through 2021, the authority plus the borough will see a savings of $650,000 in electrical charges. We bidded the, uh, our electric at the right moment with the low fees and we reduced our electric costs across the board with the borough and the authority 25%. In regards to our operation budget as we move forward to next year, as I mentioned, we're at 3.7. We are reducing by one manager next year. Uh, we're optimizing our maintenance department. One of the goals, as Mark, when he was hired, was make a maintenance division. And we are fully up and running over the last two years. And with that scope of operations, we see a benefit of our operation between water and wastewater treatment plant in excess of $250,000 a year in savings. And as I mentioned, the dryer, I'm sure you've heard the hiccups with our dryer that we've had over the last 10 years. This dryer investment that's going to be upon us is going to lower our operation budgets, as you see here, 3.7 next year. We should be down the low 3 million range. And with that in mind, if you notice the graph that we presented, you all see the haulers that come in at the wastewater treatment plant. I'm sure you see the trucks coming around the whole area. On average, we produce a truck coming in and out of the plant every five minutes. Again, as we operate the utilities department, I'm not supposed to use the word profit, but we do run it like a profit business. If you look at two, uh, through 2021, that hauling program will equal our operations budget, which means the outside waste coming in is totally paying for the wastewater treatment operations which means the ratepayers that we pay from the townships to the borough is going to go through total capital improvements, which should substantially our rates increase at a stabilized market. And you can see it, we're, if you look at the graph from the, we went back all the way to 2004, it's continuing to increase. We are in a market that with this new dryer, that's a conservative estimate of 3% increase. We anticipate we could be as high as four to five million dollars by two, two, 2021 in regards to how we market our operations at the wastewater treatment plant. And then we're also going to be introducing a new uh, at the wastewater treatment plant a, a new headwork screenings, which will anticipate another hundred to two hundred thousand dollars in maintenance costs that we currently see. With over the last ten years, if you had a chance to be at the wastewater, I'd give some of the tours. You always hear this term rags. Uh, everyone that flushes these rags on the tour, they're use, reusable wipes. Well, they cause us a tremendous amount of issues at this point in time, wear and tear in our equipment. With this projected of this new screen, which will find screen, we will no longer have a maintenance issue, which will decrease our maintenance costs because we're fine screening that out. In regards to the water treatment plant, uh, the facility, in my, in, in my perspective, is basically brand new. In the last three, four years, we've done a tremendous amount of capital improvements up there in regards to every piece of equipment has been rebuilt or brand new. Uh, and our last projection is our, our computer operation systems will be upgraded before Mark leaves, which is our last big item to do. In a quick, quick perspective, if you don't, the way that the, the authority works, the water plant is owned by the authority and operated by the borough. And the wastewater is owned by the authority and leased to the borough and operated by the borough. And basically, you know, to sum it up, the, the authority has put the vision that we're always looking for. We have a five and 10 year capital plan and obviously our goal is to stabilize and provide much, as much of our profit, if you want to say, is back to the capital improvements and improving the town. Brent, I'm Brent, I have, I have a couple questions. Um, I know that uh, different municipalities run their wastewater operations in, in different ways to be able to give capital funds back to, or contribute capital funds back to the municipality. So for example, right now your capital funds would go to the the water lines, the sewer lines, and then repaving the streets once they're replaced. Um, there's other municipalities that give back uh, funding towards the police department and the fire department. Um, is that something that could be looked into the way the, the lease is, the change in the lease in order to work with our current public, our current utilities to, there's another option of a different kind of lease to be able to put funding towards other, other expenses within the borough that are needed. 
Well, currently, as you as I mentioned, the authority or the utilities department does it put 60 to 65 percent of anyone that's a, a, in conjunction with the utilities department. If you give that perspective, what you're talking about in regards to if you look at Reading, what they do, that they have a lease system out there, and they do provide funds back to their council, uh, to their operation fund. I don't know the legalities of that. That's, that would have to turn into a legal matter, but there is options out there if you look what Reading does in other municipalities. But in regards to how we already provide services, it is providing <coughs> funds back, but not to like the departments that you're, you're mentioning. Correct. But that, but they still own, they still own that those plants. It's just that the leases is, is structured differently, so that they're getting funding to that is my whatever their needed departments are. Tuck, that's probably a legal question. Is that something that we can look into in the future? Yeah, certainly, we can look into it. I'm not familiar with the Reading structure, but if you think that's an appropriate model, we can look into it and see how that works. And then. Also, I know other municipalities do things um, differently. They do incentives for payment, and you know it's very important to get payments in quickly. Obviously, because because the the monies that you come in collect interest, or you don't want to be sitting on any kind of debts. Um, it's no secret that it's a pet peeve of mine that if you are one day late with your water, sewer, trash bill in the borough of Pottstown, you get a 10% penalty. To me, I'm going to say it's extortion. There are other municipalities that do things differently. They offer an incentive to pay your bill early instead of, instead of this huge penalty to pay your bill late. And, and that being done gets more money in quickly, and then you're not relying on, I mean, I hope that they're not funding or, or you know, making a profit off of people that are struggling to pay their utilities late. And, and I would hope that going forward, since I got no traction in that, that that is something that the council, the authority, the wastewater, the utilities will look at, take seriously into consideration, and please implement. <clears throat> Any other comments? Thank you very much. So you're basically saying that Because of the revenue that the driver is generating, well, the driver does not generate okay. the revenue. Okay. It's processing of our bio stock. Okay, because this, this process, um, at a certain time, what year was that? That then it starts generating. If you look at the current, the new dryer that we were referencing, new dryer, mm -hmm. we're going to be the dryer is 1.7 million. Okay. Based upon the review of what the, the payback period is, we're looking at three year payback for the dryer. Okay. Um, because the operate with this new dryer, we will be able to do our own maintenance, and we will not see the same same type of wear and tear like the old dryer. The old dryer was degraded by wear and tear by biosolids wearing a metal away. This is a belt type dryer, so anticipated maintenance for this dryer is seven thousand dollars a year, compared to our old dryer is about five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year maintenance. Okay. And we can do it the new dryer ourselves. It's no different than repairing a car. With my staff, compared to the old dryer, I had professional welders that were certified on our pressure vessel to do that type of work, and we do not have that capability. So, in the future, you foresee a a profit? So yes. So with this new dryer, we're going to be able to produce probably in the neighborhood of almost 160 percent processing, which opens up the avenue in this graph that we can accept more waste. We're in a limiting factor right now, but based upon with this new dryer, we're going to be able to go up 160 percent production. And that's already factored into your 2022, 2023 debt-free, or is that without that? That the debt-free is ready all factored as we're actually paying for the dryer and the capital improvements based upon our capital reserves. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation by Jamar Kelly. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have handouts for everyone except the solicitor and the secretary, my apologies. Good evening, my name is Jamara Kelly with the Governor's Center for Local Government Services. 
I am here tonight to uh, bring you information about the Early Intervention Grant Program. I mentioned it briefly about a month or two ago, um, and I came back tonight to provide more details uh, to Borough Council. The, um, some highlights about the program, it is offered to provide guidance for municipalities interested in improving their financial position. We offer financial assistance for the development and implementation of multi-year financial management plans. The maximum funding amount for the grant is $200,000 with a 50% matching requirement. We are currently um, evaluating the possibility of scaling down the matching percentage based on the fiscal health of the borough. Um, just some background information, in June of 2009, Pottstown completed its first early intervention program that was conducted by Management Partners Incorporated. <clears throat> We are recommending tonight that we up, um, actually, as a general rule of thumb, the department recommends these multi-year financial plans be updated every five years. Um, so that would bring you to about nine years since you first uh, engaged in this program. We would recommend engaging in a phase two study that would include an update of the financials from the phase one um, financial forecast in your packet, I have included um, the recommendations from the first phase uh, early intervention program. Um, some of you may not have been on council at that time. The, it's a 133-page document. I'm not going to ask you to read 133 pages, but the highlights um, from the back, the uh, cliff notes, um, are there. There were 122 recommendations. The borough followed through on the majority of those recommendations, and there were um, significant financial savings. We're coming back to say we encourage you to do another phase um, to address some of the uh, potential budget shortfalls that you're looking at in the next couple years. Um, again, we would say use these recommendations that you see before you as the baseline to uh, figure out what your priorities would be um, when you engage in the next phase of uh, the early intervention program. Um, some new areas of concentration could focus on your main street, could um, also include a component on economic and business development as well for your downtown area. The, in, two, in 2007, when you began the first phase of your early intervention program, the cost of that uh, effort was $65,000 um, from start to finish. And the borough contributed $26,000 in cash and $6,500 in in-kind services. Based on our internal review, of the audited financial statements of the borough from 2014, 15, and 16, the department is willing to reduce your matching requirement to 20%. It would be an 80-20 split on the grant funding. But it is conditioned upon the borough agreeing to um, one of the important components of the plan. There are five important components of the plan. They include a financial condition assessment, a financial trend forecasting analysis, an emergency plan if necessary, a management audit of all of the departments within the borough, a multi-year plan adoption, which includes public input um, on the uh, creation of the document, and then finally, uh, multi-year plan implementation. I would um, focus on step three, the emergency plan. Uh, I'm just gonna read the exact text of um, the language. It says, uh, the emergency plan should be included to address um, actions to be taken during six to 12 months time frame to avoid a fiscal emergency. The emergency plan should set forth a strategy regarding whether the current fiscal year's budget can and should be reopened, amended, or modified. This would be the 2018 budget. 
whether operational and or personnel reductions should occur, whether short-term borrowing, including possible unfunded debt borrowing, is necessary, and four, whether other types of administrative reorganization or short-term actions should be effectuated in order for the local government to remain solvent in the current fiscal year. Um, so we would recommend uh, a two-track approach that the, um, in engaging in the plan, the borough would look at short-term recommendations to plug what we potentially see in 2019, the borough possibly running out of funding before the end of the year. So there would be a six to 12 month emergency action plan um, to make sure the borough is financially solvent through the end of 2018. Um, and the companion track would be the five year uh, financial forecast for the borough. It would be both at the same time, short term needs being met, as well as the uh, long term financial uh, stability of the borough. And um, that's the gist of the program. I can um, answer any questions you might have about the program. Um, again, this is, it, it's, it's a voluntary program. There's no requirement that you enter into the program, but it is to your advantage to be able to do a deep dive investigation on all of the departments, all of the uh, current financial obligations, all of your future financial obligations, your collective bargaining agreements, um, any ancillary or auxiliary contracts that you may have with vendors long term, uh, your pension um, valuations, all of that gets evaluated and uh, short term and long term action plan um, to meet those uh, needs, financial needs of the borrower. You offered to reduce the matching fee to 20%. Yes, sir. That's 20% of what number? So adjusting for inflation, we don't have an exact number on these plans. Um, that's why I mentioned your first plan was 65,000. Mm -hmm. I would estimate somewhere between 75,000 and 80,000 would be the maximum cost uh, to do another phase of the plan. Mm -hmm. So we would cover 80% of that cost. Okay, so it could be 18,000, 16,000 out of our pocket. Yes. Can I ask you a question about your the first round of this was implemented in 2007 or implemented in 2009? Or it, was it a two-year study? It was, the process was initiated in 2007, application, borough council uh, resolution approving, um, entering into the grant agreement. Um, the the investigation phase, uh, meeting with all of the stakeholders, uh, choosing a financial management consultant firm. It's about a three to six month process that went into 2008. Um, the borough picked a firm, Management Partners Incorporated, and then another six to eight months of investigation. And then in 2009, June, the report was produced. So <clears throat> you said a multi-year strategy. So is this plan also for three years? and? The first plan, did it have actuarial assumptions attached to the financial pieces that could be traced? The borough would have submitted actuarial plans to the financial uh, consulting firm so that those uh, projections could be included in their forecast, yes. So you were not part of forecasting these assumptions? You were just no, DCED doesn't do anything. We help shepherd the process along. The borough picks the firm that they um, want to uh, complete their financial analysis review. You know, I'm curious. We have 122 recommendations from 2009, and I, I'm curious to know how many recommendations we accepted and are still in place at present. Because uh, I've been on enough committees and boards and, and come up with enough plans and drafts and, and this and that that just goes on a shelf, or we do it for a year and then say, oh, never mind, let's just go back to doing this the old way. So I, I would really be interested to know of the 122 what's still in place mm -hmm. in 2017. And, and just to piggyback off of that, I'm just kind of just scanning through this a little bit, and 
I see some really huge changes that, that I had recommended that have not been implemented that you guys or DCD had recommended in 2009, and here we are in 2017, and these changes have not been implemented. And, and um, Madam Vice President, that's where the voluntary portion comes in, because uh, as Councilman Arms said, you can put it on the shelf to collect dust, or you can actively implement it to the benefit of the municipality. Um, so the, the onus is really on the municipality to internalize the document. That's where the public hearing process comes in. And once you internalize it, then you figure out what works for you and what you want to implement, what's most important. And um, as you re-engage in the process, reviewing what has been done, you can figure out what has been done, what hasn't been done, and maybe what you would uh, rather do. Um, my colleague, Andrew Sheaf, has some uh, other questions. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Andrew Sheaf. I'm a local government policy manager at DCED and the Center for Local Government Services. Um, thank you for having us tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity to make a presentation here. Um, I would just add that the department really puts a premium on helping to then implement these plans that we're going to help produce. Um, one of the key factors in our um, assistance in that implementation is that municipalities who have participated in the early intervention program have taken their plan, looked at the recommendations, and then c come back to us for further grants and further phases in the plan. So to really make sure that the plan gets implemented, we can provide grants up to $200,000 to help implement some of those items that are in the plan to make sure it doesn't just sit on the shelf, and on the shelf but will be implemented. So that so was done last time or not, or you're presenting it today? Mm -hmm. Is it always a part of? It is always a part. Um, my understanding, speaking with the previous borough manager, is that a significant number of the recommendations were implemented. and financial savings were realized um, through implementing those recommendations. Uh, just one other thing, um, Madam Vice President, you had earlier comments about fire service. If you look at the recommendations, there are a few um, related to fire service. So if, um, as Andrew was mentioning, engaging in another phase, you can highlight fire service as an important area of concentration that you want to focus on implementing recommendations. And then we would provide grant funding let's say, to do a comprehensive fire study to look at um, a career department, to look at uh, regionalization consolidation, um, uh, <coughs> providing a wide range of options that council could then uh, decide to implement. And it would be um, using uh, highly technical data that is way more sophisticated than I'm able to understand. But the whatever consulting firm you choose, as well as our internal technical advisor that we would provide um, to help in the investigative part would uh, address those issues. Um, we, we've developed a very robust uh, technical assistance for blight remediation, comprehensive blight planning, um, code enforcement best practices um, that we have felt that we've helped fund in further phases of EIP. Uh, we've uh, we've helped purchase uh, new financial software. Really, I mean, it, it can really run the gamut of the things that you guys would like to implement um, from the plan that you guys will work with your consultant to help develop. Well, thank you for preparing this. I, uh, I was not on council in 2009, but I was able to obtain a copy of the, uh, the original report, and yes, it's rather cumbersome mm -hmm. to read, so I'm glad you highlighted sure. specifically what I need to be looking at. The, the grant, um, just to also add, there's no specific window. We uh, received an appropriation, obviously, uh, from the uh, legislature, and uh, we recently did receive that uh, now that our budget has been paid for. Um, so we have funding until the funding runs out. So it's to your advantage to apply earlier instead of waiting until maybe June and then we're out of money and then we have to wait until the next budget gets approved, whenever that gets approved kind of thing. Um, so it would be to the advantage of the borough 
to apply um, early. We uh, were also able to offer technical assistance in your uh, borough manager search that you potentially may embark on um, uh, with the departure of the current borough manager. We can offer assistance for that. Any other comments? Pardon? No. As far as in-kind services, is that still also on the table? Yes. I believe so. You say that I he cringed when he said it. Possibly. We're reducing the mess to 20%. Uh, um, but yeah, it's certainly uh, we could it's on have the table for discussion. Yeah, we can, we can look into it and get back to you. Okay. I would suggest to council if, uh, if it is your desire uh, to move forward with this, Obviously, the concern is where do you get the money to pay um, that 20% or what it might be. I remind you that you will <coughs> most likely be without a borough manager. Um, I, would, I don't know your intent, but I would expect more than likely the first few months of next year. Um, so you'll enjoy a savings on salary and during that time frame that could be diverted um, to help cover this cost. Mm -hmm. And I, could, could we pay our 20% out of the savings? I'm sorry. Could we pay our 20% later out of the savings? Um, hey, if you uh, don't ask, you don't get. Payment, payments are made as invoices are <clears throat> uh, submitted. And mm -hmm. we reimburse uh, invoices as soon as we get them. There's about four to six week turnaround at most. Okay. So as you send money out, we get it right back to you as soon as you get that mm -hmm. invoice to us. Um, one other thing I would add, uh, because the borough has some difficult decisions to make going forward, um, this sort of uh, technical plan gives you a leg to stand on um, to explain uh, to your constituency why you need to make the difficult choices that you may or may not have to make um, to shore up your financial uh, future of the borough. One thing uh, with recommendation 72 being define and implement best management, best management practices for stormwater management is now a mandate that's coming to us from the state. Yes, yes it is. To have not only the, the plan of stormwater management, but to have a different department created. So here we are saying we're going to help you save, we're going to help you spend at the same time. Explain that, how that works. We are here to help improve the efficiency and uh, effectiveness of uh, local governance. Um, so as new mandates come in, uh, we don't just say, hey, you go figure it out on your own. We're still here to help. And uh, these sorts of plans can help you figure out where to cut um, and or where to save so that you can implement whatever new uh, regulations may or not be coming um, from Harrisburg or from Washington. Because each entity that's a part of the stormwater management, like say for example, West, Upper and Lower, they each have their own government. They're each going to be required to have a separate leader for this. And yet we're distributing all the water to all of them. It just seems like an overreach of government. That's my opinion, but in the dollars amount, it would be fiscally more conservative to have one manager for all of the water, all of the people that are being supplied by the borough authority. I'm still getting up to speed on stormwater management, but what I have learned so far is that it is totally separate from water and sewer. I agree, and I understand that, and it relates to um, how waters are feeding back to the main body as far as uh, pollution, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back that all of these are draining back to the Schuylkill River and their inlet source is also the Schuylkill River and their payee for services is the Borough Authority of Pottstown, whether it's lower, west, or upper. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I'm just saying, I, I just want to point that out, that it, it is an overreach. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, if there's no further comment, we'll add this for Monday evening. Uh, see if we want to go forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, a presentation from the Coburgdale Railroad about their land development. Nathaniel Guest. All right, I'd like to um, introduce Nathaniel Guest of the Coburgdale Railroad Preservation Trust, as well as Ken Pick from the Berks County Redevelopment Authority. Um, the Redevelopment Authority, as you may know, owns the, um, the property that the Colbrookdale uh, Railroad operates upon. And as you also probably know, that they have um, some plans, some very exciting plans, to build a station uh, adjacent to Memorial Park. And uh, along with the station, there'll be some uh, other site improvements, sidewalks, uh, stairways, pathways, um, parking spaces, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, associated with this with this project um, we've sat down and reviewed the plans internally with staff and um, we are recommending um, that they, they would have to go through um, uh, land development um, due to the nature of the improvements that, that they are uh, planning for this project um, however due to time constraints uh, we're recommending that uh, the actual uh, procedural requirements uh, be reduced um, so that they can get this building constructed. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over to, to Nathaniel and Ken, and they can um, divulge the details to council. Thank you, Justin. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, speak with you. Uh, it's been some time since the last time I presented to you about the railroad and the station project. And uh, luckily, I know in the ensuing time, many of you have actually come and, and ridden the railroad, uh, perhaps a, for a first or second time. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do that to uh, please see our progress firsthand. Um, the very first time I spoke to the, uh, this august body was nearly uh, four years ago. And as Steve Taroni reminded me, I had more hair back then. Um, and uh, it was about really a project that was just a project in planning at that time to uh, convert the Civil War era railroad and linking us with Boyertown and Berks County uh, into a regional tourism destination. Uh, I, I suspected at the time and, and haven't been proven wrong that it uh, was, is, and probably will continue to be a Herculean task. Um, during that time, I, when I first spoke to this group, I underscored the importance of a station in Pottstown terminus in Pottstown, where the tourist railroad passengers will become shoppers, visitors, hikers, bikers, so on and so forth, in affecting the community and economic development goals and benefits of the Colebrookdale Railroad project to the people of Pottstown. The railroad is generating about two to three million dollars a year in economic impact, um, and much of that is being afforded to Boyertown uh, because of the absence of a station in Pottstown. Um, and because of that, consequently, our activity is primarily focused in Boyertown. DCED recognized the value uh, of the station in uh, Memorial Park, so thank, thank you, DCED. Um, affording the Colebrookdale Railroad uh, a grant during the very first round of multimodal, multimodal projects, which is very exciting. Uh, and in fact, it, it is that grant that's really driving the timeline that we're working on. Uh, it's a significant grant. Um, designing the station uh, has been an important task um, and you've got packets before you um, and you can see how that design has evolved and, and what we're offering and I, if it's, uh, it's alright I'd like to, to skip ahead to the slide that shows the elevation uh, this is what you will see from the park I still have some fundraising to do so I'm going to put a footnote to that but you know I have naive confidence um, so it, in the ensuing time from when I, we first got the grant, it's been a project of really evolving a design. And I think uh, of all the things you might say about the design, it is highly evolved. Um, and really, you've heard the expression, good, fast, or cheap. I think ultimately we've gone for extraordinary, not just good. <coughs> um, Pottstown's my home, uh, and it's important to me that whatever we build here uh, really reflect who we want to be and how we want to be perceived. And I think this building does that. Um, so uh, I think the elevation is most is instructive, but you can also see um, uh, we've got in your, in your packet perhaps uh, the floor plans and you can see what things are offered in that. This is the, uh, the lower level floor plan. There's also an upper level floor plan 
uh, that shows the, uh, the, the main passenger area that has the, uh, the bathrooms, uh, perhaps the most important amenity for the tourist going uh, passenger, uh, as well as um, uh, flexible space, ticketing space, and what have you. Um, part of the um, challenge of the space uh, is that, as you know, the railroad owns a sliver of land um, nearly nine miles long between uh, Pottstown at milepost 0.0, .0 uh, all the way to uh, milepost 8.6 in Boyertown. Um, and uh, it is, it has, uh, if you were to look at the property description, it would be uh, longer than the DCED grant application that we talked about. It's, it would stand about this thick because uh, there are strange parcels located all over the place. Uh, and sometimes that uh, runs to our burden and sometimes it runs to our benefit. Um, the parcel in, Montgomery, uh, in uh, Memorial Park um, is actually very, very thin and very, very narrow. Uh, and so in the designing of the building, one of the ways in which the design evolved was to reflect the fact that there, there are limitations there that we simply can't overcome. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Pick to talk about the site. Oh, oh that's Gary about that. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, it became very apparent that this project was not going to fit inside the, uh, the, the railroad right away. Uh, some of it would spill into or have to be built in uh, Memorial Park. You can see it's a little bit of the foundation, the walkway. Uh, the stairway and then the walkway down into the to the handicapped parking spaces. <clears throat> so this was uh, quite a challenge. How are we going to deal with this? What, what kind of mechanism can we can we uh, use to solve this problem? Actually, it was Justin's idea that perhaps it would be a combination of a, uh, a land swap for the majority of the improvements and then work by others, work by the project on your park. Uh, the parcel that we're talking about, the land swap is a about 6,059 square feet, 6,060 square feet. We have a, we'll offer you an equal amount of land to add to your park. There's some uh, excess land further at, towards the, uh, no, okay, there you go. You can see the, the pink area, we have some land up there. Uh, we can offer you uh, an equal amount of land as a swap. And to accomplish this, we, uh, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, so, go ahead. Um, initially when they, they brought this uh, project to me and, and they realized that they maybe needed a little more area for the footprint of the, of the building, um, I said, well, we may be able to work out an exchange here that's beneficial to everyone um, because, uh, as you are aware, uh, the Tri-County Trail Plan um, and also the, the Montgomery County 2011 Primary Trail Network Plan calls for the Manitoni Trail to go along the, generally along the alignment of the railroad or between the railroad and the, and the Manitowney Creek from the Scooper River Trail um, towards, towards the north and points beyond. Um, we've also uh, had discussions about how, how the intersection at, at Shoemaker Road and Route 100 is not very conducive to pedestrians and, and the Tri-County Trail study had in essence uh, posed a partial solution to that project problem by taking a trail underneath Route 100 um, to get to get to the north side um, and the Pottstown um, shopping center area. So um, uh, what, what, when we started to look at this, what we saw was this green sliver um, of land up here that we're pro proposing that Colbrookdale conveys to the borough as a part of this swap so that we could get the right of way and the land area needed in order to bring a, a trail all the way through. Um, Memorial Park and, and underneath Route, Route 100. Um, the pink area that's shaded, that's the Colbrookdale right away. And the green area is obviously Memorial Park. Um, you can see that the Colbrookdale right away pinches Memorial Park between um, their land and the Manitowney Creek, which, which would, um, you know, essentially not really allow us to get any sort of trail uh, in, that, in that location. Um, the, this area is also being surveyed as a part of the Tri-County Trail study. Right now, the, the consultants next week will have a survey plan and um, preliminary engineering plans for the trail alignment through this segment, um, at which point um, we'll have more, more information to, to know exactly what area of land we would need from Colbrookdale um, to make this work out. So um, we don't have all the details yet, but we have approximate equal portions of land um, that uh, could be could be used, I think, to the benefit of, of both parties. 
just wanted to point out a couple of things from, from the slide. So <clears throat> it's the, making out the railroad right of way on the slide is not quite as easy as it probably is on the plans you have in front of you, but the majority, the vast majority of the building does sit on the railroad owned ground, uh, ground that the railroad currently owns behind the blue line. Okay, behind the blue line. Um, so there's a small section of the building and some of the walkway that would go on to uh, ground that's currently part of uh, Memorial Park. Uh, if, the, if we could proceed forward with this land swap to facilitate your creation of the trail um, and, and the building of this building, then the only things that would be on uh, borough ground would be a portion of the walkway and then the five handicapped parking, uh, parking spaces, five ADA parking spaces we'd be building in the park. So part and parcel of the request for an expedited uh, uh, land development process is the fact much of the building uh, is actually on railroad ground and therefore not uh, subject to a land development process anyway. Did I miss any? Uh, sure. So uh, construction needs to start in March of 2018 uh, uh, and, and conclude by December 31st at midnight uh, of 2018. <laughs> uh, so Santa himself might be slinging hammers up there um, next year. and uh, we're. We're very glad, in fact, that there is a deadline because the, we, we want this building built for, for both for us and for Pottstown. And I think from the borough's standpoint, I mean, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't want, you know, we could we could lease some of the ground to the Cobaldale Railroad, but we would essentially be leasing, you know, part of the, part of the building's foundation. It just doesn't make any sense. It makes sense for this building to be on all one parcel. They have to um, compose a land development plan anyway. Um, which we can incorporate a lot line change into. Um, so uh, I think it's the cleanest um, option that we're really presented with. This swap, uh, must it be of equal square footage or equal market value for both? I think uh, I have an expert next to me. Yeah, I think we're talking about uh, a land swap, and we're looking at what is equal market value, so to speak, of, of what we're trying to do. I think conceptually, uh, they laid out what they like to do, but there are really three issues in front of council, and I think the biggest thing is whether you agree with the concept of what's being proposed. The three issues that we're looking at, one is essentially uh, do you uh, – favor or will you support a land swap as been described with the idea that the, the borough would give up a piece of land in the park in exchange for getting a piece of land that has equal value uh, to the borough. And anytime you convey real estate, the borough code has requirements, so we would need to make sure that if you wanted to do that, we complied with those provisions. The second thing we'd have to do is obviously create a subdivision since we're creating a parcel that now doesn't exist. So there'd be a subdivision process, at least of borough land, creating a very unusual lot that frankly wouldn't meet any of the zoning ordinance requirements, and we'd figure out a way to make sure we did that in a legal fashion, at the same time meet the time frames that the railroad has if you support the concept. Uh, along with the subdivision then, they're asking for a waiver of the land development requirement. I understand they're not asking for a waiver of any of the substantive requirements, rather the process to facilitate a, a quick in-house review of all ordinances. So all the ordinances would still apply, but the borough does have a process called an in-house or informal land development that has been done before for minor projects. So this would typically be a project that would qualify for an in-house land development anyhow if council agrees. So those are the three components that I think would have to be undertaken in a short time frame. But the first thing is that you have to embrace the concept of what's being proposed. So again, given the time frame we're talking about, I almost need some kind of vote conceptually Monday night to start the process so we can identify all the issues and, and figure out how to do this and still be compliant with state law and local ordinance. Thank you. Well, first, I was a little disappointed that we'd not be getting uh, the Frank Furnace uh, station, but however, this looks fantastic. I mean, for the mansard roofs and the in the height of the, of the structure itself, too, it looks like it from the top of the steeples around 100 feet or so. So that should be obviously very clearly visible from 100, and I assume from 
422 as well for all the vehicles mm -hmm. something new built here. I'd be happy to help in any way. It's, it's the goal to make it visible from Route 100 uh, and to be a part of the Pottstown skyline. Mm -hmm. uh, the piece of property that you want to uh, exchange, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it or not. Did you mention, like, uh, what the, the, the square footage of it would be? Or, like, I'm sure it's not an acre or anything, but... 6,000 6, square feet. 6,000 square feet. And what's the uh, square footage of the building, which doesn't have anything to do with that, but... Um, it's roughly 4,000 square feet, I think, between two levels. So it's like 2,000 on each level. It, it is not, it, it is a building that looks larger than it is. Yeah. Well, I saw the building in Boyertown, so it would be a little bit bigger, I'd be bigger than that one. Bigger than that, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Which is, that's a lovely building over there. Thank you. I think the question was, uh, are there budgetary, budgetary constraints that could result in a building looking less than this? Um, I keep being told I need to be realistic, uh, though I, I hate that conversation. So, um, uh, yes, it's possible that if we don't raise the funding, it, it, you, know, you see, a, you see a, a more scaled back tower. Uh, as one potential in, in this image, but uh, obviously the goal uh, is to build the building on the right. Any other questions? Because we're doing this as mm. Sorry, can you hear me, Bill? Because uh, we're doing uh, potentially a land swap, you know, we ran into that trouble with the um, what is it, the pumping station in Memorial Park, and we ended up having to get, like, it, it, that's not going to be a problem, correct? No, that, that's correct because the actual um, the land that we were assuming for the offset actually not only includes the footprint around the station, so the red area, but it actually goes all the way out to the parking area. Um, we included that all as you know, Colbrookdale use as a non-recreational use because at the time we didn't really know where the station was going to go, um, so we just assumed the greatest amount of land we can possibly think of at that time. So it it, it, it will uh, be covered under that um, replacement that we're still obligated to. It doesn't change that in any way. Okay, if there's nothing else, we'll list this for Monday evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, 13. Uh, Title is zoning 306 North Charlotte Street. And, uh, Mr. Garner, uh, would you explain the situation? Sure. We received a uh, the zoning hearing board received an application for zoning relief for a property on 306 North Charlotte Street. And uh, my suggestion is, if Borough Council is inclined to uh, take a position or participate in the hearing, we have a discussion in executive session under the heading of litigation. Um, the proposed use at this, in this is a group home, which I understand is permitted in this district by special exception. And a review of the application would seem to indicate that the uh, applicant is able or asserts they're able to meet the special exception criteria. So uh, that's what's before you. Very good. Uh, 14 is Bethel Community Church. So w wait, can I, we are going to discuss this in an executive session? Executive. Yes. Okay. I'm recommending that if you want to discuss it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Bethel Community Church. Uh, you're here to talk about your tax abatement or you're going to check okay. um, on this issue. Sure. I think council has received some information from Bethel Community Church with respect to the property located at uh, 575 North Kime Street. Uh, essentially, the church is asking for an abatement of accrued real estate tax from the borough. I believe the approximate a total is $16,000. Um, just for a little bit of background, this property had always been a religious use. Uh, it had been exempt from the tax rolls uh, when it was owned by the prior owner. Uh, I understand from the Board of Assessment when the church acquired the property, uh, typically when a property transfers, it automatically comes back onto the tax rolls. 
Uh, the reason there was even a tax assessment was there was a question of whether or not an exempt application was timely filed. Um, since that time, I understand the church did file for tax exempt relief. They were granted that relief by the Board of Assessment. So we're looking at an interim period of about May of 2016 to the end of 2017 that it was on the tax rolls. Candidly, it probably shouldn't have been because the use was the same use, religious use, from the prior owner to the current owner. Um, and the church is asking that they be relieved from, the, from that interim tax obligation. And I hope I explained that correctly, but that is uh, what happened here. So they're asking you and the school district, obviously you can't speak for the school district, to uh, not uh, require them to pay the taxes during that interim time. And Chuck, I understand that this this amount is not because it because it was a religious use. Um, it, it had been anticipated to be tax exempt. This amount is not included in our in our budget numbers. That, that, that's correct. There, again, this is really a dynamic that occurred based upon either the failure to or the <coughs> untimely filing of a re request for tax exempt status. So, the property in theory always would have been exempt, but for that issue. Okay. So we'll list this for Monday evening. And 15 uh, YWCA parking agreement. Uh, Mr. Flanders, you'll explain. We have a uh, letter of request from the YWCA <coughs> um, to renew their parking agreement with the borough under new terms. Um, as council is aware, there is a parking committee currently um, investigating parking throughout the borough and it's my understanding from the chief that most likely in January at the latest February um, the committee will be providing council with a report mm -hmm. um, with that in mind I, I don't know that it would be wise to um, change your agreement with the YWCA or enter into a new agreement um, so I spoke with Stacy Woodland who is the executive director at the YWCA and suggested to her um, that rather than enter into a discussion about a new multi-year lease, perhaps it would make more sense um, to extend the existing agreement, which I believe you all received copies of um, in your packets, um, for a period of term until council determines how they are going to handle parking throughout the borough going forward. Um, so my recommendation would be that rather than even begin discussing a new agreement, simply give them an extension, whatever term council sees fit to do so. Um, going into 2018. Okay. Perhaps until the new report comes in. Correct. Perhaps it would be smart to do it either quarterly or month to month. Okay. Hearing no opposition, we'll list this for Monday evening. <clears throat> uh, 16 is the chemical bids. And we only have. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Can we? Um, my apologies. Can we go? 15 a minute so we're going to extend this are we agreeing to extend it month to month or quarter like month to month I, month to month because the the parking committee should be hopefully ready in january with a proposal that's going to resolve parking through borough wide right i just want to be clear on that yes. okay okay we'll see that the wording is month to month and uh, in 16 the chemical bids we only have uh, four chemicals uh, We all have to print out the recommendations from the Public Works. Any questions on this? This will be through uh, our utility department. Oh, utilities. Okay. There are no issues. We'll list this for approval Monday evening. And now into the year-end items. Uh, first being to adopt a budget for 2018. Well, last month, we started this with uh, my giving you a little bit of history about the borough and their finances. And in the, the last eight years that I've been here, we've watched this borough become more lean, more efficient, uh, more fiscally responsible through the efforts of our staff, our manager, our finance director and that. We went from no bond rating to a double A. Uh, we paid off finances with exorbitant uh, interest rates. They're gone. We joined with others to 
be able to purchase our supplies at a lower cost. Uh, our departments have become more streamlined. Not that they can't improve in the future. Uh, there were some personnel er, reductions, some shifting of personnel. And through the efforts of this council, we brought the residents three years of zero tax increase. We were well on our way trying to do that again this year until we were hit with quite a tragedy. Uh, I don't know how many hundreds of assessment appeals went to Norristown, and whereby the assessments were lowered, but it's an exorbitant amount at the cost of losing $31 million in revenue. Uh, to support this condition that we're in, <clears throat> there was an article in yesterday's Mercury he was talking about the cost of our police department. And through the efforts of, of our, our boys in blue and women in blue and the best efforts they've made, we've watched crime go down significantly, especially in your ward, Mr. Pasco, and, and others. And, and it seems the general opinion that even though the cost is very, very high and a major portion of this year's budget, people out there like and want to maintain our police department. You heard earlier from our fire departments, um, and, and they're doing a, a whole lot with very little. Uh, we're at a point that there's, we got all the low hanging fruit. We, we trimmed as much fat as we could to run as lean as possible. And, and there's not much to take away uh, unless there's a huge demand to cut services. And that would mean we take more policemen off the street, we cut back on fire protection services, we might uh, go into the office operations here in this building and reduce attendance and service at the windows, so if you want to pay your bill, we'll only be open Tuesday for that. And if uh, you want to go to codes or licensing and get a permit, uh, We'll do that on Thursday. If you at home have a sewage backup, uh, you can call in. They accept calls on Friday. We're that close right now. Um, I, I commend the council and I commend the staff for all that we've done in the last eight years. But we're up against a wall of lowered assessments. So uh, I thank you, Mr. Hilton, for explaining further our situation here and uh, we, let me we hear you. Dennis and I have recommendations that we would like to make good we do believe that we can cut this down much further good so do we do we have to, to vote to, to you know do anything to, to start this discussion other than well, well, your uh, beginnings here well have your ideas been submitted can, well, can I just right, now. right can I just make one I have one general comment. Mm -hmm. I follow Evan Brandt on Twitter and, and his blog. And uh, what I noticed at the end of the year, he, he's posting all these meetings where the um, business manager is making their presentations on the budget, proposed budget. And I don't recall us having a budget presentation as a council at the end of the year. So th that was just something that I thought was worthy to note. Um, and just to make it clear, I guess, when was that? Last month we said we're going to try to cap this at an 18.61 increase, correct? That was that, that was the motion that was made. Yes. We're, we're not going to exceed that. Yes. Mm -hmm. With the hope that we were going to decrease that, so it would go down. And this budget that we're, that's proposed to be adopted is still at the 18.61 increase, percent increase. So clearly we have more work to do. Go ahead. Okay. I think, I think that one thing I'll agree with you on is um, we have to determine what the residents, what's important to the residents of the borough of Pottstown. Mm -hmm. Our police services, our fire services, our safety protection is important to the residents of the borough of Pottstown. Um, there are some other things that we can do without that, that as a taxpayer, um, I'm sure that we can do about, we need feet on the street. We need people on the street, not so much people in offices. So, 
I have some recommendations that I'd like to make that will help. And if we look at DCED's um, recommendations from 2009, you'll see that some of them are in here. It was very important to bring on um, some, we got to close the fire gap. Some of the things that even are in these recommendations we need to do and we have just begun doing. For example, the fire inspections of the retail, commercial, industrial uh, properties have to be done annually. That's, that's by regulation. That's by NFPA regulation. They had not been being done annually previously. Um, they now are starting to be done annually. I think we need to close the fire gap, and I also think we need to push a little more money into that fire tax to get these guys that are responsible for million dollars worth of equipment a raise. It is absurd that they are making $11.50, $10, and $12 an hour. So if we can agree to the things that we support, we can start knocking off some of the things that we can agree that we can do without. So let's start there. How many people agree on that? The police and the fire. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So where are you suggesting the cuts be? All right. <clears throat> No Public Works Assistance Director. That was $170,000 that was put into the budget. I don't think there's a need to fill that position now. It doesn't exist. Um, we still have a Public Works Director. Recommendation by DCED is to actually put the public, the utilities and the Public Works together as one. So right now, I'm just recommending the Assistant Public Works Director, $170,000 a year. Eliminate the assistant borough manager position. Justin, you're still here. I'm only suggesting that once we have a borough manager in place that we do not fill, backfill an assistant borough manager position. Eliminate one position in, in human resources. Uh, the recommendation by DCD is to have the borough manager be the director of human resources. Limit the service, the walk-in service, to finance and public works. That eliminates one admin in each one of those departments. Uh, you may want to do that in codes as well and eliminate a, an admin position in there. Reduce the grants administration position to part-time or three-quarter time, whatever is paid by, in full by part. That position is my understanding that it is mostly responsible for the, 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 the the record keeping of the transportation, part pays for that portion, part can pay for that entire portion. That would eliminate the, that would eliminate the insurance and all the benefits that, that go along with that. Eliminate our contributions to paid and to the Human Relations Commission. So let's go down them one by one and see what we can agree on because we're going to have to vote on these separately. I would think that we need to know who's going to support what. If I, if I could just make an observation to remind council, um, while I understand you want to look to places to save money, which is what you're supposed to do, under your borough manager's ordinance, the borough manager controls the workplace and controls the personnel, so determines who is, who is here and who shouldn't be here. Except for the assistant borough manager and the borough manager, council has abdicated by ordinance the authority to arrange and direct the workplace uh, to the borough manager. So if you can direct what services you'd like to see cut, then the borough manager can undertake to see what happens in order to accomplish what you want to do. But as far as the personnel, unfortunately, council isn't in control of the personnel the borough manager is. Okay. So what we are control so of, I am not going to vote myself $161 a year tax increase. So, and, and, and so and let's, do it, by, let's do it by that. services. Let's do it by services. Mm -hmm. We want to cut. We want to cut some some services in human resources. We want to cut some services in finance. We want to cut some services in public works. We want to cut some services in grants administration. We want to cut some services in license and inspection. Can we all agree to those cuts and services? Not until we see the numbers. Uh, I think I would like to say, you say we want to go. I don't That's have why no I'm idea. No, and I don't want to go that way. We should check it out everything yeah. together <coughs> as a council and decide what we're to do together now in this meeting and then later do the presentation. But we can't, like that, we have to, we, we, 
That's why I'm, I'm, saying, I'm asking now what we as a council agree to. We have two meetings left before this budget is adopted. Otherwise, we have to schedule special public meetings. So we have to work this out now or Monday. That's it. That's that's our options. Well, no, we have till the end of the year, and we can have additional we meetings. Can make like but that. we don't. We, no. we don't have the special meetings because it, well, last year I said we need to have a special meeting right. for this budget, and we didn't. We just went went through the motions and just did it. So mm -hmm. we don't do it. We don't do what's asked. We, we were asked all to come with individual recommendations right. for for uh, what we could eliminate, and I didn't hear that from you. I, I didn't hear what you what your cost savings were. So we we all need to our feet are to the fire. We need to right. figure this out, and Cheryl is trying to figure it out now. Right. So well, she's made her suggestions, and we need to know what I how much that will save for us. Three months. Correct. Right. Well, and you've had since July. The administration has since had since July to figure it out, and they haven't figured it out. So now we need to figure well, it out. Then we can charge them with that for Monday evening <laughs> and find out what so, that is. So was yeah. the borough manager will come back with a change in millage with these suggestions as mm -hmm. a comparative? Is that possible? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll need a, a line item of savings for each one. So it's, if I may. Sure. So it's, it's easy to say cut HR yeah. services, cut finance yeah. services, cut licensing inspection services. At the end of the day, what services do you want to cut? For instance, public works, do you want to cut snow plowing or snow removal out of the borough budget? Um, finance, do you, do you want to cut, I don't know, collecting payments that come through the window? I think I gave this to you, the walk-in walk customers service, the walk-in customer service. I gave you exactly what I'm saying that you could cut. That's and the service that I'm that, recommending. That is not something that can happen instantly. Um, we can't throw the switch and on January 1st say there will be no more customer service at the windows. Um, this, this is why you have heard me ad nauseum in this forum personally and in finance meetings saying tell me what services. What services are you willing to tell the taxpayers of Pottstown they, can, they are no longer going to get? And the examples I used um, are examples of services. To, to say generically, cut, cut HR services. What services do you want to cut? Uh, how about the borough manager take responsibility of the human resources director position? So the borough manager was never responsible. The assistant borough manager was. And it was discovered that neither the borough manager nor the assistant manager has the legal background or the training to deal with the intrinsic issues of human resources, the liability issues, nor um, does the borough manager or the assistant borough manager have the time to deal with HIPAA issues. Um, so the decision was made to create a department to manage human resources, which is professionally what a human resources manager does. If you want a borough manager who is a human resources director, you need to hire one that's trained and certified. I agree. Maybe we should look into that in our replacement of a borough manager. Okay. So what more do you need to give us uh, cost effect? I need to know what services you are willing to do without. And from that, once you tell me what services you are willing to eliminate to do without, we will figure out how to make that happen and tell you what savings, if any, are going to be afforded through cutting those services out. That's what I say. We have to figure it out and figure out the numbers and the decision. I mean, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a real make decision today. We have to talk about it, get together, put numbers together, and then decide. So, the services? Walk in customer service to the residents to public works, finance, and license and inspection. Is everybody, anybody in agreement to those services that we could do without? So we're saying no window service in Barrow Hall. Well, maybe it doesn't have to be five days a week. Depends on how much it's going to cost us, I suppose. Or save us. Yeah. And are you willing, you have to take into consideration, let's use, I'll use licensing and inspections for a moment. Are you willing to accept the fact that people that are coming to get permits, people that are coming to get plans reviewed, 
um, developers that are engaging in projects, are you prepared to deal with the fact that they won't be able, <coughs> they will not be able to get the things they need in the timely fashion they need, and therefore um, economic development will most likely be stifled through that process. Those are the ancillary problems. Is it your assertion occur. that other municipalities, all municipalities have walk-in service? I don't know what all other municipalities do, so I would never assert that without the knowledge. I, I think my concern with, I mean, I, I see where you're coming from, Cheryl. My concern is this. I already pay too much in taxes, so to, for the borough to say, oh, no, you can't come in here and there's no window service, so what am I paying for then? You know, that, that's my concern. Well, maybe not cut it out five days a week, but maybe we can eliminate one position, one administration position from each department. So you're open from <coughs> four to, or one to four, rather than 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. I think the general feeling I'm getting is that you and I are, are trying to make cuts, and I don't know that we're getting any buy-in. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody All better right, buy so in because we're not going to vote for an 18% tax increase. We can increase. make it, but we have to do it in a way, not just like that. Well, Nick, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question on the floor is, what service do you want to cut? What, what should we stop doing? The only one that will really make a significant impact is the police department. And I, I'm not mm -hmm. in favor of that. I disagree. I disagree. We well, can cut uh, out a half a million dollars in personnel costs without ever touching the police or the fire department. At least a half a million dollars. By closing all the windows. Or what? One of the other things. To Say, we, we don't have the numbers yet. You know, you suggested we cut back. Well, I suggest you get the numbers because these are not new suggestions. These are things that I've been asking for for months and months and months and months. So you've had months to put together those numbers. Okay, wait, did we do this on Monday? We can send all the information and make a decision by the weekend. Well, it, it, we if you tell Mr. Flanders what service you suggest he cut, he can have finance decide or compute how much that will save us. Is that correct? Specifically, yes, but keep in mind those numbers are going, and I'll use the uh, numbers that Mr. Wagner provided you earlier, um, six, most of those positions, with, with the exception of licensing and inspections, um, six, somewhere between 50 and 65 percent of the salaries are covered through the court. So the impact on the general fund is going to be minimal. If you recall, um, early on in this process, I said in order to affect a major savings in the general fund, um, it would be 33 civilian positions or 17 police officers or some combination thereof. Um, and that would be to balance the budget without a tax increase based on the current numbers. Um, so by simply closing the window and eliminating positions, single positions um, within those departments, um, you, you are not even going to come close um, to affecting the savings you're trying to affect. In the licensing and inspections arena, keep in mind that licensing and inspections is revenue neutral. So the employees there are, although they're funded from the general fund, you have to look at the revenue side. Um, the, licensing and the licensing and inspection department is majorly funded by the fees that we collect. If you eliminate positions, the revenue side goes down. So again, we have a, a catch-22. But nonetheless, that's it. Okay. So from that list, you need more definition? I'm not sure what services you're looking to cut, except for the fact that if I heard Council Miller correct, she wants to know what savings we would affect by limiting hours um, mm -hmm. at each of our walk-up <laughs> windows. And we will have a number. Okay. That's not the only one. Additionally, you're, you're, you have three very talented grant writers and seekers in this borough, Justin Keller, Michael Lenhart, and the circuit writer, Michael Lane. If between the three of them, they cannot seek out, write, and administer grants, I think that we have some problems. So again, you since that position is being paid mostly by part, 
I'm saying to you, let the, the part of the position that's been paying by part continue to be paid by part, but cut that position back to a three-quarter or half time, whatever that funding is that you're getting from part, and that eliminates, that eliminates from the borough the cost of insurance and, and um, you know, like holiday pay and, and all the, the, the benefits other incentives and benefits so therein lies the rub what services what services are you looking to do i'm not sure reduce? why you're having difficulty with this mr flanders it is your job as the borough manager to be to make personnel to make personnel streamline cuts so we have we have streamlined we have cut we have worked um diligently over the past years you recall the budgets over the past years have come in less than the previous year unfortunately this year it didn't work out that way because of uh, as mr we described earlier some issues that have occurred with our finances that we didn't anticipate and none, meantime none, personnel none, costs have risen nonetheless the you're correct I, I i quite well know my job and i would suggest to you that council's job is to tell me what services not what employees and I will figure out from those service cuts how to make it happen with personnel. Well, those services, services in those departments, you think you can handle that much by Monday? Mm -hmm. Mr. Wayne, I think that this is your turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to calculate uh, savings by closing the windows. Okay. Uh, removing the assistant uh, for public works. Eliminating an assistant borough manager position. Assistant borough manager position. Grants administration. Sorry? Grants. Let's cut something from <clears throat> grants if you don't like the, the, yeah. the, and, the term and, of a specific person. What would be the savings if you eliminated the grants administrator or, or just reduced it to what's paid by part? And then we're going to, uh, uh, what is it you would like the others to not do when they're covering for that part of the grants administrator that's not there? If you're going to, if you're going to put the workload on, on, on the assistant borough manager or... Well, I, see, I don't think it's about cutting grants. I, I think it's about it taking on... But it's about taking on more responsibility. This is what happens. It, a, any workplace, what we decide we're going to start cutting positions or, or personnel, other people pick up the slack. They don't want to pick up the slack. They go find some work somewhere else. That that's where I'm at. Okay, so it's it's, it's, uh, it's obvious to me that that I mean everybody knows that the way we're going now is just it's just not sustainable it just can't keep going the way we're going now mainly because our income reduces every single year okay um i don't know what's the number three million we lost this year three million something like that i don't know it, it reduces every year did, are, did we lose in revenue our assessed valuation we did not lose three million dollars what is it do you know the number of the news to the news every year because of the assessment? It's around 100,000 from the assessments each year. Okay. Um, so we're losing income every single year. Mm -hmm. whether, whatever it is, $100,000, still a lot of money. Right. We're losing every single year. Okay? Right. Um, so that's, uh, over time, that's un unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So just like you, you do in your home, you have to find the places where you can cut. We've all said that we can't cut. We can't cut any more places. This department can't cut anymore. They can't cut anymore. When we get to that point, I hate to say, but we have to look at staff. I mean, I, I hate to. Okay. We, we have to look at staff. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be done now. Obviously, we can't sit here and put people on the spot and try to make them answer right now. Right. Okay. But. Um, so do you, do you have, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's, let's just say over the next, you know, first quarter or so. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hate to throw committees at problems, but you know, let's sit down and 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 do a feasibility. You know, we, we there's more people here. We can do it ourselves without going out and 
and paying someone to do it. Let's put something together and mm -hmm. look at our staff right. and see where we can cut. And just like you said, it's just a matter of people picking up the slack. Mm -hmm. We don't have to cut services. Mm -hmm. We can cut staff and, and wherever uh, you know, things are missing, people fill in the gap. That's what we, do, that's what we all do at our jobs. People get fired and we fill in the gap. That's what we do at our jobs. So, so it's, it's not making any, any leeway here, putting people on the spot and making them answer right now. That's not, that's not solving anything. You know. But if there's an area you have in mind that, that you think could be cut back, whatever service that might be, tell us now and we'll have... No, no we're not, we're not, we can't go that, that way. We can't, we can't do that discussion right now. Sir, sir, this service get cut, that service get cut. That's, that's putting people on the spot and, and, and we can't do that right now. I'm saying let, over the next couple of months, maybe the first quarter of next year, let's put mm -hmm. something together. We can do a feasibility and, 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 and decide. Well, that and, sounds and, and, reasonable. And look at it, look at it strategically, no, line by line, that, and see where, and where we can cut staff. That sounds reasonable. And where, and where that staff can fill in. So it's mm -hmm. planned. It's right. not done Hector Skechter or whatever it is. Is you saying we can wait that we have to plan until December 21st? Yes. Okay. We have time. Even, even if we have to come here to have an extra meeting, mm -hmm. we need to do it. I mean, I basically agree what the other counselors are saying, those two counselors are saying, but um, it, it, it can't be done right. now. Well, it, it has to be done before the end of the year, Joe, because this is what this is the budget that we're facing now. And and again, and I and I hate to put it back on to to management, but th these are the th same things that I've been saying for at least three months. There's no reason that this feasibility study could not have been undertaken in the last three months. Well, you know and what? It it's not. It's not done. It's not okay? done. So it's not done. It's not done. So, 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 we, so, we so back to banter back and forth. No, but what I'm saying is, I'm not gonna. We're, we can't adopt an 18% tax increase. So whatever we figure out has to be done before December 31st. So I'm not saying it has to be done right now at the second, but it has to be done before December 31st. That's true. What is the total? Um, what is the percentage of all employees? 33, is it what percentage? Is it 25%? Is it 25%? Sandy, what's our total staff count? 135. 135. I do think something that we can probably try to agree on is that eliminating donations or whatever you want to say, uh, payments we make to different uh, organizations like Paid, the Senior Center. Um, I, I don't know. I rattled off a list of them at a, at a meeting a while ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, I look at those as well. I mean, it, like, it comes to maybe, what would you say, Dennis, maybe a little under $50,000 altogether, which is significant to me if that's something that you want to go uh, as I support that. Sure. It's more than $50,000. I don't remember the time. I'm going to be honest. I don't it's, remember. It's 45000 for paid, 20000 for paid, 25000 economic mm -hmm. development, 7000 mm -hmm. the Human Relations Commission, mm -hmm. 3000 for the Senior Center. I go half for paid. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, those? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can have those figures to us before Monday. Okay. Uh, and I guess there's no room to do quite deep. Not at this point. I think both of those were just listed because right. you contemplate action Monday night in some fashion in the budget <coughs> and, and a tax ordinance or you're going to have another meeting before the right. end of the year. Yes. And uh, an amendment fee resolution. Is there a goal number? Are you working towards a goal? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to get it's closer to a goal of no more than 8% of a tax increase. All right. Uh, D is the 2018 council meeting schedule uh, was published and sent to you. And I, I guess it'll be reviewed again and get off the January with the new board. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. Board vacancies. Uh, Construction Code Board of Appeals. Do you have any people for No, we do not. Do not. Human Relations Commission, there's one vacant term to expire, one nine 
in 21. To make things easier, Ms. Wien, I recommend that B and C be moved to January. Okay. So we'll move B and C to January. And then uh, under 19, the board vacancies, the blighted property review committee, there's four one-year terms to expire December 31, 2017. And uh, as far as I know, all four have applied to be reappointed. Correct. Okay. These have all been advertised, Mr. Wynn, and they're mm -hmm. all, the ones you're on now are also. Okay. Planning commission, one four-year term to expire in February. Uh, Pottstown Borough Authority, one five-year term to expire January 1, 2018. Uh, Carol Thomas, or Tom Carroll has come forward on that. Uh, vacancy board one one year term to expire December 31, 2017. Uh, any applicants for that? Vacancy. Perfect. Two for that. Okay. E is zoning hearing board one three year term and alternate uh, to expire January 1, 2018. And we have two names for that. Okay. 20 is HARB administratively approved. Uh, the documents are in your pack. 111 King Street and 131 King Street. You good? Yep. All right. All right now uh, we have time for comments from our citizens that are present. Thanks. Okay. And uh, th there is a time limitation of three minutes. Per person, Jill Dugan. Sure. Um, I just wanted to take a minute, real quick, to remind everybody about the weekend events that are going on for the holidays, starting December eighth and ending on the tenth. We have Santa coming. We have cookie decorating and all kinds of things are in the brochure. They're on our website, downtownpottstown.org. Um, I also wanted to take a minute and thank a few people that really pulled through for me this year with the holiday decorations. If you've noticed, we have some three-dimensional reindeer. They were done by the school district, um, the high school construction crew. We are hoping that we will gain more of them so that in Smith Family Plaza we'll have more next year. Um, the two-dimensional ones were done by Art Fusion and Advantage Insurance. They cut those out for me. and. We had a lot of people out helping out to get the planners to no longer become trash bins, but to have decorations in them. And Ringingdale Christmas Tree Farm donated all of the greens for that. Um, we had just a whole lot of people. Junior ROTC came out, the community action group, um, individuals, Lisa Haverly from Operation Backpack brought a crowd in to help out. Um, and one person that I really wanna end with is a gentleman called Hoagie, is what I know him as. Um, he has been raking all the leaves in our downtown and he just does it because he loves the community. And if you've had ever time to meet him, you will see him pushing his cart and filling his bag. He does it all the time and he's just a really great guy. And I hope that if anybody sees him on the street that you thank him for what he's doing because the downtown is looking really good. And it's definitely because of what he's doing. So, thank you. Next. So next is April Borcassi. Um, she had to leave for another engagement. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Yerger, I see you're signed up here. Okay. That's the extent. Okay. Uh, you're now at Councilor's General Discussion. And I, I, tonight I want to start with... Uh, Councillor Paez, do you want to tell us about the mural? Yes, uh, I invite everybody to come on Saturday, uh, 10 o'clock, Saturday night, December 9th at 10 o'clock, to the dedication of the new mural uh, done in Beach Street, 638 Beach Street. Uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you to the borough and the council for that beautiful job they allow us to do. Great. Councillor Kirkland. Um, I believe this is the last meeting with the cameras with, uh, you know, Councilor Miller and uh, um, Flanders and America. <laughs> it happens. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you very much for your service. Um, it was an honor working with all of you. Um, you know, I, I hope to continue working with you, uh, you know, in the future. 
Um, I feel that you all have, um, have shown a great dedication to the people of this town and to your work, and that's very commendable. Um, and I just uh, just wanted to say, you know, just thank you very much for your service. Right. Councilor Arms. Uh, yeah, I just echo the same thing as Joe. Cheryl, I'll miss shooting daggers at you from over here. Um, <laughs> I mean, we got along fine. Uh, I'm glad we we didn't we weren't always on the same page. Um, Mark and and Mayor Thomas, it was nice working with you guys too. I hope you enjoy your time off. That's for sure. Councilor Miller. Um, I never thought I'd say that I'm going to miss the daggers, Councilor Arms, but I I believe that I am. Um, I this being this one being one of the last um, council meetings, I just want to say a couple things. One, um, Mr. Flanders, there was no misperception in the memo sent to the fire companies. I, I, I have a copy of that memo. So I just want to say to council because, you know, as I pursue other things and you guys are going to be in charge and you're going to be, please pay attention to what's going on because there are seven counselors and at no time should one counselor being no matter what position they are in be dictating anything, any decisions for the entire council without reviewing that with council to get a vote on. I want to give a very special thanks to three borough businesses that are helping me get Pottstown Paul's off the ground. Not just because they're passionate about Pottstown and helping small businesses succeed, but also because, because they believe in a cause greater than themselves. So I want to say thank you to Charlie Pierce of the Trophy and Plaque Shack, Ed Wysock of Advantage Insurance, and Gus Tellus of PCTV. I'd also like to recognize Complete Graphics for taking care of all my professional printing and design needs at a very reasonable price with excellent customer-friendly service. So I want to tell everyone to please check out these businesses. They are local. See what they have to offer. Three of them are right along High Street. Um, Brina, I'm sorry I can't go to your dedication at 10 a.m. on Saturday because I'll be Santa downtown taking pet photos. But if everybody watches the November Borough Buzz, it opens up in front of the mural on Beach Street and it is absolutely beautiful. Councillor Culp. Uh, I want to wish uh, uh, Sharon and Cheryl a good luck in your new endeavors, whatever they may be. And we're going to miss you. And um, good luck to Mr. Flanders down in Delaware, huh? <laughs> well, I'm hoping I hear say, some, yeah, from my constituents about their thoughts about the budget. You know, it's, uh, I don't get as many, you know, finishing up my first term, as many complaints as I thought I would, given the situation, uh, in the, I guess, in the first board. So it's a, it's a, especially now, I'm hoping I'm here. To go. People's okay. thoughts on that. Um, yeah, and my thoughts and prayers to the family that placed the displaced to the fire, and I hope you know, I'm glad that the uh, fire department was there and took you know, care of it very quickly and effectively. And uh, yeah, so thank you to Cheryl, Madam Mayor, Mr. Flanders. It's uh, been educational for the last four years. <laughs> thank you. Very good, Mayor Thomas. That was a good uh, segue remark about educational. Um, I will be continuing to other things, but uh, not far from the community at heart, where there are still a lot of esoteric grassroots needs that have been a major focal point um, of this term. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the one with cameras in the classroom is really going to be uh, a big one because of, you know, the growing incidences that relate around bullying and other issues that are becoming, in some instances, potentially unsafe. Not saying that they are exclusively unsafe, but you have to uh, be able to put a safeguard in once a flag goes up. And a serious flag has been presented to me. and. Um, that will be some of the onus of the beginning of the time off. <laughs> and I'd just like to thank the police department because there's a lot that is going on now with the opioid crisis that kind of is turning them into somewhat medical personnel um, in the application of Narcan, even though there's assistance, of course, through 
uh, the ambulance services are usually the first ones there. And is that correct? Usually the police are the first ones there. And I've had uh, many reports of uh, the lives that were saved, but it, it's a growing challenge. It's a growing challenge, not only in this town, borough, region, but all across the United States of America. And um, I'd just like to thank you because you are intervening in so many social service areas where there's so much risk, um, especially in the area of domestic violence. And also with the growing impulsivity of our communities with the influx of people with very different needs, very different perspectives on how you should live, and that's also a part of your management when you go out to answer what you may seem to interpret as a simple call when you receive it and get there and find out that it's multi-dimensional types of things that are going on, often that requires two or three cars and backup. You know, in the beginning I didn't understand that, but today I understand <coughs> that, um, very intrinsically. So um, in having that, um, what do they call this position of political subdivision, has allowed me to um, have many ride-alongs and to get to know uh, some of you personally, not all of you, you know, but to know that cohesively that you work as a unit under good leadership. And of course, um, my prayers will stay with you because it's everybody's safety that you're concerned for and your safety as well is inclusive. Um, I'd just like to um, address Mr. Flanders as working with him both as the police chief and as the borough manager. Um, the difficult task of making the calls on the different budgets, and um, I do remember one is specifically challenged budget, budget season where there was a fiscal decision and I had to break a tie, and that tie breaker went against uh, some people's uh, better intentions at heart, but it was in regards to which was the most fiscally conservative decision. And um, under intense heat, that decision was made. So as you begin and continue to scale down uh, the budget, you have a lot to look back on in remembrances of how it happened in different seasons. And uh, now we have the, the reality of the um, those who have went to challenge their assessments. So I trust that, you know, the information we're given is the information that's accurate in all the numbers. You know, these, these numbers are not often something that's at the purview of addition, which is why I asked about the actuarial assumptions that were given when this study was done in 2007. My interpretation of this type of study was that it was seeing in a projected manner the numerical status of the finances, but it was just taking what already existed and putting it into another geographic, not an evaluative type of decision. So, you know, we can look through this and see what was done and what wasn't done, but ultimately it's going to be year by year and will there become a point where there will be some type of engagement with higher government as far as what's managed and how it's managed we can't say that but it, there are tools out there to help in those particular dire conditions and situations um thank you cheryl for uh, all of your pet enthusiasm it hasn't rubbed off completely, so, but thanks for the energy. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Well, uh, to those who will not be joining us next year, uh, I, I really wish you well. I wish the three of you to have uh, phenomenal futures. And, and don't forget us. Come back. Visit. Help. Give us suggestions, anything, everything. Uh, we will be closing this meeting. We're going into an executive session. As our solicitor mentioned, one issue is uh, potential litigation, and the other is personnel. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>